It is Wednesday, February 15th, 2023. This is a regular session of the Bloomington Common Council. Thank you all for being here. Uh, will the clerk please start us off by calling the roll? Yes, Council Member Rosenbarger. Sandberg. Here. Piedmont Smith. Here. Scambalori. Here. Rollo. Here. Sims. Here. Smith. Here. Volan. Here. <laughs> Thank you. We'll now move into a land and labor acknowledgement for the city of Bloomington. We recognize that the city of Bloomington sits on native land. The city, as well as city administrative buildings, are on the traditional homelands of the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, and Shawnee people. And we acknowledge that they are past, present, and future caretakers of this land. We also acknowledge that much of the economic progress and development in Indiana, and specifically Bloomington, resulted from the unpaid labor and forced servitude of people of color, specifically enslaved African labor. We acknowledge that this land remains home to and a site of gathering and healing for many indigenous and other people of color and commit to the work necessary to create and promote a more equitable and just Bloomington. We move forward knowing and acknowledging our rich, complicated, and sometimes painful past so that we can learn from it and create a true land of opportunity. So, our agenda this evening, uh, in summary, we'll begin with an approval of minutes. We have one set from September 2020. We'll then move into reports. We'll have reports from council members. Then we'll move into the reports from the mayor and city offices. We have one report that evening on the public input on the use of home and ARPA funding. We'll then move into reports from council committees. We have the sidewalk committee uh, that we will hear from this evening. We'll then move into our first of two periods of public comment. We'll move then to appointments to boards and commissions. And then we'll take up legislation for second readings and resolutions. There we have resolution 23-04, a resolution authorizing the 2023 expanded outdoor dining program in the downtown corridor. We'll then move to legislation for first readings. We have one item there, Ordinance 23-03, to amend Title 15 of the Bloomington Municipal Code, entitled Vehicles and Traffic, regarding amending Section 15.12.010 to remove seven stop intersections, to add six stop intersections, and to delete one four-way stop intersection. Section 15.12.020, to add one yield intersection, Section 15.32.030 to delete angled parking on 4th Street between College Avenue and Gentry Street. Section 15-32-080 to add no parking spaces on Dun or excuse me on Duncan Drive, 19th Street and Strong Drive and to remove no parking spaces on Grant Street and 19th Street. And section 15-6 15.32.090 to add limited parking zones to 8th Street. We'll then move into our second of two periods of public comment, and then we'll take up matters of council scheduling before we adjourn. So with that, let's move into the approval of minutes. Madam President, I move the approval of the 7th, September 16th, 2020 regular session minutes. Second. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Those are approved. Thank you. Let's move into reports. This evening we'll start with council member reports and I'll begin on my far right. Council member Rosenberger. No report tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Council member Sandberg. Thank you. Um, since attending the Lake Monroe Watershed Summit in Brown County on October the 22nd, I've been paying particular attention to the health and needed protections of Lake Monroe. The funky tastes and smells that appear in our drinking water are symptoms that require further diagnoses. Prevention and remediation is the key. As the sole source of our drinking water, Lake Monroe is such an important resource for the city of Bloomington. We owe it to our residents to safeguard our water supply. The Hoosier National Forest's intention to log, burn, and apply pesticides to thousands of acres within the Lake Monroe watershed should be of grave concern to us all. Others, including Monroe County, Friends of Lake Monroe, 
the Hoosier Environmental Council, and the Indiana Forest Alliance have challenged this action through public comment and the courts. The City of Bloomington has not engaged in this issue even though it is my understanding that the Forest Service is required to consider requests from municipalities that ask for special protections of Forest Service land within the municipal watersheds. I question why the city was not a party to the comments during the project proposal period and is not now a party to the lawsuit. Why have we stood on the sidelines when others go to bat to protect our water supply? I urge colleagues on this council to take a stronger position regarding the U.S. Forest Service. Lake Monroe is one of the most important environmental assets to protect. Delivery of clean, safe drinking water is one of the most important public services we provide for our community. To the extent that we can join forces with other environmental entities that are sounding the alarm about watershed threats, the city of Bloomington should take more of a leadership role. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes, thank you. Um, I had a constituent meeting uh, this past Saturday uh, with 11 people via Zoom, and I just wanted to report out um, a few things that were discussed um, in the hopes that it'll encourage more people to come to, come to the meetings um, that I have every month. So uh, we discussed the um, the CREED funds, the Community Revitalization Enhancement District funds that uh, the City of Bloomington um, has um, that have a sunset on them, and that was actually a, a relevant question one of my constituents asked is when, by when do we have to spend the funds and how will they be spent? Um, and that's something I'm, I'm investigating. Uh, then um, there was talk about, uh, of course, some of the legislation we have tonight, and um, you know, I'll bring that up at the appropriate time. Uh, we also, um, there were two people on the call um, who uh, had um, some, uh, some expert knowledge regarding the uh, report on public safety that took place last Thursday um, by the uh, chief of police, the chief of our fire department, and the director of our community and family resources department. Um, some uh, st data shared at that report was, was uh, quite concerning, especially about violent crime. Um, and uh, so um, both Shruti Rana, who is on the Board of Public Safety, and um, Jason McCallick, who is on the Community Advisory on Public Safety Committee, um, shared their thoughts on um, public safety and the report. Um, then, uh, we also talked briefly about um, how the Traffic Commission should really uh, take into account um, all uh, accidents, not just those involving cars, um, because certainly bicycles, uh, pedestrians can have accidents that may not involve moving cars. And then we, we talked about the work of the Special Committee on Council Processes that started last week and will be continuing um, next week with a report back to this body on March 1st. Um, and now, uh, if I may, um, Madam President, just on behalf of um, Council Member Flaherty, who is unable to be here tonight due to professional or, uh, obligations, um, he wanted to share, this is Council Member Flaherty, uh, representative at large, um, he has his constituent meeting um, has changed to the fourth Monday of the month at 5.30 p.m. And the details and the link, uh, those are held via Zoom, the link will be on the city council page, so bloomington.in.gov slash council. Um, the change is due to a recurring conflict with the Monroe County Health Equity Council, a group which grew out of the Community Voices in Health Advisory Council, and which focused in part on more deliberative, collaborative, and equitable public engagement. And um, Council Member Flaherty says he is planning to re-engage with the group as that he thinks that they could help the council's new special committee on processes that I mentioned earlier. So um, that's a report on behalf of my colleague. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rollo. Thank you. I have a couple items. Um, one is I would like to announce that um, Council Member Sandberg and I share a constituent meeting uh, on the third Saturday of the month, and that will be on February 18th, this coming Saturday from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. 
and you can uh, find the Zoom link by uh, going to bloomington.in.gov forward slash and you'll see uh, the, uh, the, the announcement for it there and you can, you can follow it to the calendar and to the Zoom link. Uh, we invite everybody that uh, would like to attend to uh, please do so. Um, I also wanted to tag on to Councilmember Sandberg's comment because I think it's extremely vital for the community to have this understanding that um, the, uh, the Forest Service is allowing clear cutting of thousands of acres in the Lake Monroe watershed, which is, is very, uh, e extremely concerning. Um, we already have a lake that is, it was uh, created in the early 60s and it had a longevity of about 100 years. And so we're, we hope that it's going to last longer and it is the sole water supply for Bloomington. It's of course a recreational lake a reservoir, it's used for fishing and boating and so forth. Um, but it's been suffering in, in, in the last years because of nutrient flows that are coming in and, and causing algal blooms, or that is uh, cyanobacteria blue-green algae, which bloom, some of the uh, bacteria are toxic. Um, they also die off um, uh, they, because um, as they grow, they, they essentially overpopulate and you end up with uh, die-offs that affects oxygen, so it affects fish and so forth. Um, and it, usually what it renders is uh, greater efforts by utilities to add chemicals to, uh, to treat the water. And that ends up tasting bad at the very least. But we really need to go to the source that is the lake and, and the uh, quality of the water uh, that goes into it. Um, so uh, I would just like to do a shout out to uh, the Friends of Lake Monroe group, which Councilmember Sandberg referred to. You can find them at friendsoflakemonroe.org, and they focus on data gathering, policy, and uh, collaboration with uh, members of the community to try to protect our watershed. And they're currently doing uh, monitoring efforts uh, at the at the lake. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Sims. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I also second all the comments um, with regard to Lake Monroe that my colleagues have made. Um, in fact, if it's possible, I would like to call for the city, the county, the township, um, elected officials, friends of Lake Monroe. I think it's about time that we all got together, pooled resources in order to deal with um, the U.S. Forest Service. Um, I sit on the Utility Service Board. I know firsthand what my colleagues are talking about, but I also know um, who, who and what we're up against with regard to that from a federal, can you hear me now? I'm sorry, from a federal standpoint. So I second that. Uh, but what I really wanted to speak on this evening, and there's a lot of uh, negativity and negative things we could talk about this evening. Um, there's still too many guns in this country that is causing us killings and, and injuries. Um, we have issues with other foreign governments. But what I'd like to do is focus more on this community. Um, I attended a rally um, out in Dunmeadow a couple weeks ago, um, having to do with um, an Asian American woman who was attacked on one of our city buses. Um, and we were there in support of the AAPI. And I, I know it was a different organization, um, but I know the Asian American and Pacific Islander population and we were there to support them and show that we care. Um, I was very happy to see a couple of my colleagues there as well. Um, so that's a good thing for this community, that we can rally, we can get together, and we can stand for what's right. Nextly, and I'll be brief as possible, this is still Black History Month. There are so many events going on in this city that I think um, helps, the, helps the community, helps our knowledge helps our history. One of the things that I would really, really like to emphasize, there is so much black history that has not been taught in mainstream history. So, I mean, I could say some things right now and many of you in the audience would be, you know, you'd have that look. And no, you wouldn't know. And there's no way you can know because it's not part of the American history that we've been taught and studied over the years. If I wanna emphasize one thing with Black History Month, understand that black history is American history, 
And once we learn all this together, then I think we'll be a much better community uh, because of it. Um, that's all I have to say this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Smith. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I just wanted to uh, report, I, I went to a, a neighborhood meeting um, in Park Ridge uh, on Zoom on Monday, and we talked about stormwater control. There's been some flooding issues with some, uh, some of the neighborhoods. It's older, doesn't have uh, all the, the ditches and, and culverts all fixed up. So we've been working on that, and uh, utilities department responded and did some great work, and uh, we're still talking about that. Um, so that was great. Uh, uh, talked with Mitch Rice, Ellen Mills, and Steve Akers, and uh, some other folks there. Um, the other thing that just came up was um, I had somebody from the neighborhood ask about what about um, trains with hazardous material going through Bloomington and whether that is something that goes through the Park Ridge East, Park Ridge area where it has those train tracks. Um, I do remember a few years ago there was some hazardous materials that um, somebody caught wind of, no pun intended. Um, and um, so uh, I have sent a note today uh, on behalf of uh, Mr. Grace to uh, the city to ask, you know, are there any regulations regarding that and, and how that works? Um, because I don't, I don't recall exactly how that happened, uh, you know, eh, three or four years ago. Um, so thank you. I just, those are a couple things I just want to say about that meeting we had in, in uh, uh, the neighborhood meeting. So thank you. Thank you. Council Member Volan. Thank you. Um, I've often said that had I known 20 years ago when I started in this job that being a city council member would involve so much interaction with the county, I might have thought twice about taking this job. But sure enough, a lot of what we do as city council members involves how the county does business. So it's too late now. I've been doing it for too long. And I've indeed learned a lot about the county and its inter interaction with the city. Um, and so it comes to talking about not just the jail, but the entire county justice system. Uh, the commissioners, the county commissioners say that they need five acres minimum to build a new jail complex. Uh, this body, they asked this body to rezone uh, an area of land around Fullerton Pike, the extreme edge of the city, next to I-69 uh, for a new jail with the intention that the entire justice complex would move eventually to that area of town, which is otherwise a greenfield with no infrastructure whatsoever, several dozen acres. Uh, this body unanimously rejected that rezone for good reason. Uh, we've often said that the jail should not be that far away. This county has one village, Steinsville, one town, Ellettsville, and one big city. Bloomington was established by the commissioners as the county seat 200 years ago. It was a creation of the county. And, but the city has now grown to comprise almost 60% of the population of the county. We are the majority of the county population. That the commissioners are even contemplating building a jail as far away as they can from its current location, let alone outside the county seat, I think is a tragic mistake. It's gonna have negative consequences for decades to come. Ask anyone who's attended the meetings of the CGRC, the Community Justice Response Committee. The prosecutors don't think it's a good idea. The public defenders don't think it's a good idea. The probation officers don't think it's a good idea. The judges don't think it's a good idea. The county council, doesn't think it's a good idea. The only people who think it's a good idea are the three commissioners. Let me just say, for my part, without doubt, the jail needs to stay in the city of Bloomington. It really should stay downtown. I think it's time for a grand bargain. The commissioners don't need five acres. What they want to do is build a campus. And it's not a good idea. A campus is isolating. A campus is separate from all the other functions that make a city thrive. Ask anyone who works 
in the justice complex downtown. And you'll see how much they shop downtown, how much they eat downtown, how much they rely on those services downtown within walking distance of their offices uh, to get through the day. And that's just from an employment perspective, let alone from a rehabilitation perspective. So the idea that somehow they need to build a campus is suspect at best. I don't think they need that many acres. I think they just don't want to have to build up. Unfortunately, uh, with all due respect to both offices, the mayor is as stubborn as the commissioners. There's very good, little goodwill between their mutual offices. I think the technical term to describe all four of them is stubborn cusses. Uh, they've been unable to come to terms, for example, on plans for using the food and beverage tax to expand the convention center. Meanwhile, the city, or rather I should say the administration, is building an important new neighborhood in the old hospital district. But the administration has not deigned to include the council in this master planning for the district that they've christened Hopewell. We haven't had much of a say about what will go there, although I'm happy to say that a majority of this body forced them to come to the table when it came time to determine how this new phoenix of a neighborhood uh, was to be platted and ensured that there wouldn't be uh, monolithic buildings there uh, that, that were an entire city block, that there were alleys to break up building mass. Nevertheless, even though a jail could, and our current jail does take up an entire, entire city block, I'd be willing, uh, as one member, to waive that concern if it meant that we could keep the jail downtown. I also don't believe that it needs five acres. I think that a grand bargain is in order. The administration needs to offer up at least three acres to the county and use it to negotiate for an understanding on the convention center. There's no reason why we can't come to a deal, but it requires personal diplomacy, not just from people like us, but from the mayor and the commissioners themselves. The time for bickering has to end. None of them can allow this decision to be made if it's going to affect not just the, the city, but the entire county for generations. It's a bad idea to move the jail outside the center of town. Hopewell is the best hope for where to put a new jail, and it's time that we all pushed to uh, the, the mayor and the commissioners to establish an agreement that will allow it to stay close to town. That's the best place for it, in my opinion. Uh, there's plenty more to say on it, but I hope that others will join me in insisting that we not allow the commissioners to move the jail to the remotest parts of the county when it should stay in the city that we are proud to say is the county seat of Monroe County. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Let's move now into reports from the mayor and city offices. I believe we have Mr. Zodi with us this evening from Housing and Neighborhood Development. Thank you, Madam President, <clears throat> council members. Um, make sure my clicker is operational here. Okay. Um, thank you for giving me some time again tonight. As you'll recall, um, last month I came to you just to let you know, uh, remind you as well, that uh, the city is receiving an allocation of uh, funds from the American Rescue Plan that are being moved through the Home Investment Partnerships Program, which is administered by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. And so my goal for tonight is to uh, continue to make you aware of what the latest is with that planning process, make members of the public aware and invite them to comment on this uh, as it moves along in the process. So just to recap, uh, the city is going to receive uh, $2,045,000 in these funds. Um, and they must be used to serve four qualifying populations of, uh, of people who are defined under federal regulations as uh, homeless or at risk of homelessness. Um, these are four uh, populations very specifically defined in federal regulation. Number one is homeless, uh, folks that you would consider to be chronically unhoused uh, or experiencing homelessness. Uh, at risk of homelessness, more related to uh, a financial uh, housing insecurity uh, condition. Those who are fleeing are attempting to flee domestic violence or dating violence, sexual assault, stalking, and human trafficking. And then number four, other populations requiring services or housing assistance 
to prevent homelessness uh, or others who are at great risk of housing instability. So you might think of those experiencing substance abuse, mental health disorder, uh, veterans are a member of, uh, would be in this fourth uh, qualifying population. <clears throat> the use of the funds are prescribed um, to supportive services, to nonprofit operation and capacity building, rental housing development, acquisition and development of non-congregate shelter. Uh, so independent sleeping and uh, sort of bathing uh, facilities, not what you would consider a traditional shelter environment. And then uh, the tenant-based rental assistance program, which is an existing federal program through the home program uh, that, uh, that the city already has an existing contract on. Um, so we've been doing uh, outreach on this uh, since November. We've done 32 meetings and conversations with service providers, housing agencies, community groups, and elected officials. Um, we've had three public meeting presentations here at the council. The first one was in November when I gave my housing report. The second one was in January, and the third one is tonight. And then we are holding two public hearings, uh, both at uh, meetings of the Redevelopment Commission. Uh, the first one was on February 6th, and the next one will be Monday at 5 o'clock in the McCloskey Room, which is available, obviously, on Zoom and in person if people are interested. Since we last... I last presented information to you. We have moved along and are starting to narrow down our focus. Um, what this is, and let me say a minute about that, that this is an allocation plan. So I'm drafting an allocation plan for these funds that will have to go to the, uh, the HUD department and be approved. And so that'll be an iterative process over the next several months. But uh, the feedback we've received is uh, a focused approach on supportive services. So assessment services, when you look at the continuum of services for uh, those who are unhoused or at risk of being unhoused, um, assessment services to uh, become a part of the coordinated entry system, uh, case management, housing navigation, case management is sort of ongoing. Um, so uh, if someone is housed, uh, how do we, uh, keep them housed and, and look at what, what, what vulnerabilities there might be and uh, in, in their um, status. And then uh, street outreach, the direct service that takes place uh, by a number of agencies and, and volunteers, um, that's important um, to do ongoing street outreach to be in touch with um, those who are unhoused or those who are working with uh, the uh, population who are at risk of homelessness. And of course, medical services. Groups like uh, HealthNet provide a lot of medical service and triage uh, to those uh, who might be unhoused. And then, of course, there's rental projects that are coming on down the pipeline, uh, those that have supportive housing included in them, not sort of general uh, affordable housing, but affordable housing that has supportive housing in it. So people who are, uh, who are taking part of services um, that are provided by a local agency may be residing in a supportive housing unit. And then, uh, of course, we want to dovetail and support the efforts of the Heading Home Initiative, uh, which uh, we've, you all know very well, and the community is starting to know uh, even better. Uh, we want to dovetail with those efforts and the funds that the city and the county have contributed to uh, see that effort advance. So the draft budget, uh, as I mentioned, if we narrow this into supportive services, this is sort of where we're heading. This is a draft budget. It could change, but uh, sort of where we're looking at. Um, we have a few projects uh, that are uh, potentially coming online that uh, could receive some funds for this that will have supportive housing units in them. Nonprofit operating and capacity building will be capacity building and operating to prepare to receive funds like this. So if we do a grant program and an agency wants to apply, we have to make sure they're prepared to receive and administer these funds. And this is, uh, this is uh, uh, these are categories that are capped statutorily and are designed to help them uh, increase their capacity to administer a program that would be done through this, um, this stream of funding. Uh, it's not just general operating or general capacity building. It would be in direct relation to these funds. And then administration and planning, which uh, council members are familiar with, with federal funds, the city does receive a portion of that to help administer the money through payroll and, and other costs associated with administering federal funds. So the total allocation is $2,045,237. That has to be spent by September 30th of 2030. Uh, and so we have a number of years to do that once the plan is approved. So just once again, our public comment opportunities. We'll have a hearing next Monday at the Redevelopment Commission starting at 5 p.m. 
then we will have a required official public comment period for two weeks uh, starting around the beginning of March. I don't have dates in here yet because uh, those are flexible. Once we notice, they're set in the paper, but we're looking at the beginning of March for 15 days. The plan, the draft plan is required to be up for public comment, and that'll be on the city website, uh, at the library, here at City Hall, uh, that kind of thing. People will be able to comment. Um, and there will be comment, there'll be contact information in there on where comments should be directed. In the interim, uh, people who, uh, if anybody's watching tonight or watching tomorrow, um, they're welcome to email me at hand at bloomington.in.gov and I'd like to see comments back by March 15th um, because the plan is due by March 31st. Our goal is to get in a week early um, to make sure we are have all of our ducks in a row there. So I wanted to share that update with you tonight. Happy to take any questions and appreciate the time again. Great. Thank you, Mr. Zodi. Questions from council? Council member Volan. Thank you. Um, a couple things. Could you put the slides back up? Um, can you uh, describe in more detail exactly how you, what does non-congregate shelter really mean? back there and the uses right there You'll see the uh, fourth bullet so um, because the American Rescue Plan was a pandemic related uh, appropriation um, the funds have to be used can only be used for the acquisition development of non-congregate so congregate shelter is uh, what you might consider a traditional shelter environment so if people are um, all sleeping in the same room uh, sort of common uh, restrooms, bathing facilities, that kind of thing. Non-congregate would be independent sleeping rooms, independent bathing. So because there is a uh, environment where there could be a greater risk of the spread of COVID um, is the reason sort of the non-congregate uh, specification is in there. So it's more like a, uh, a dorm than a barracks? Uh, yes, I'm trying to think of. In other words, a barracks where everybody sleeps in like that's right. Uh, bunks in the middle of one big mm -hmm. room versus a dorm where people have individual rooms even if they share facilities. That's right. Um, so that would be non-congregate. So when you say acquisition and development of it, I mean, I don't know of any such shelters in, the, in town or the county. Right. Are there any? Uh, I would uh, want to defer to our service providers to determine how they, I think most of them are congregate. We do have a family shelter which has separate um, you know, uh, rooms and facilities for each family. So I would be careful to qualify that uh, without talking to our service providers, but it's not prevalent. And so uh, the funds will also say these, um, you don't have to use them in each category. So that the supportive services is where we see that most of that priority right now being directed. So you don't, you're not required to spend funds in all of the eligible categories. So right now we don't have, um, that is one of the categories for expenditure. Well, I think my most, I'm most intrigued by the word acquisition. Mm -hmm. um, it, do you, are you looking to acquire non-congregate? When you say acquisition, yeah. what do you mean by that? Well, that is a, that's the prescribed use. We don't actually intend, based on the consultation, so the, when you draft an allocation plan, the consultation, what you've heard back from the community is extremely important. Um, we don't have any funds right now uh, for this category in the in the draft budget so but that would mean acquisition so if there's a facility or a building uh, for instance that had um, uh, non-congregate rooms so let's say there was a hotel for purchase that's one that could be so there's a hotel that is looking to be sold and you could potentially acquire the building to develop non-congregate shelter there because there are separate sleeping facilities so we can go ahead a couple of slides to um, I think the the budget draft yeah. yeah so then you say development of affordable rental housing mm -hmm. so is that not-for-profit or private or city-owned uh, wouldn't be city-owned it would be private so there are two projects um, there's one particularly the um, two projects coming online in Bloomington that have supportive housing units in them uh, as part of the project the the projected project for the core administration building at Hopewell has um, projected 10 units of supportive housing for clients who are uh, undergoing treatment um, in partnership with Centerstone. And then the retreat at Switchyard project, which is down at 1720 South Walnut, um, is, has a partnership with Stonebelt uh, that has 10 units of supportive housing. So projects like those could be eligible because those units, that subset of units could be eligible to receive and be supported by funds 
like this to support the development of the project. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Council Member Sims and Council Member Smith. Thank you, thank you for the report, um, Mr. Zodi. Um, the use of home and ARP funds, and you say we have until September of 2030 to exhaust those funds? That's right. Um, about seven years from now, thereabouts. Mm -hmm. Do you anticipate or are you aware of future revenue stream funds once we have spent this, or is this a ongoing federal program? I know some of it's pandemic based, so obviously that won't be there, at least under that umbrella. But sure. what do you think? Yeah. Because once that we start all this stuff, we're going to have to fund it and sustain it. Exactly. Well, and okay. I'm glad you brought that up, Council Member Sims, because uh, this is a one-time allocation. So the home program is ongoing. So the city receives an allocation of roughly $500,000 a year through the home program. The home ARP was a $5 billion appropriation from the American Rescue Plan that was directed through the home program, right? So that is a one-time allocation. Whether more money comes later, I can't say, but it is important to point out to your question that when we're looking at how we program out these dollars, one thing I've been conversing with community partners about is what is the sustainability of the programs? How do we do this in a way that doesn't say, here we are, we've got this money for a certain amount of years, and then what? And so the then what question has been the pretty robust conversation, so I think it's important. Also, um, when you look at using, let's say we do, this budget is what ends up being approved, uh, we've got roughly $800,000, $900,000 in a grant program spread out over six years. I think by the time this plan gets approved, it will be later this year, so let's say six years. Either way, spreading that money out over that period of time is not a lot uh, when, you, when you boil it down. So um, I think we've got to be very mindful of the time in which we award the funds and how we narrow that focus, and then what is the, and how we answer that then what question, what are organizations going to do to continue those supportive services once the money runs out? It's a uh, very relevant question. Yep, thank you. Council Member uh, Smith. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Zodi. I have two kind of different questions. One, is the data going to go into the housing security database or the, the heading home database that uh, is, I think it's a, it's a federal database on persons that are uh, experiencing homelessness? So there's the HMI, HMIS system, which is the yes. uh, Homeless Management Information System, I believe is what it's uh, called. I, may, I hope I've gotten that acronym correct. but. There is that database that we would pull data from, and uh, these funds are very much uh, focused on the outcomes and what the, the gaps are in the community. So one of the things we want to try to do in submitting the plan is identify those gaps, uh, which the Heading Home Initiative is working on that as well. So I expect the data question to be an ongoing sort of conversation, and I actually just talked to Mary Morgan about this last week, who's the director of the housing security for Heading Home, as you know. Um, the data question is very important, and they want to see outcomes. We all want to see outcomes, and how do yes. we how do we move that needle on making homelessness uh, rare, brief, and non-repeating, which is the mission of the Heading Home Initiative? Absolutely, and and kind of a somewhat related question is the so the grant process is that going to be that the awards will be granted yearly from people submitting? Mm -hmm. So you're saying yes? No, I was oh. just sort of. Not even oh, you, oh, you, okay. You're, <laughs> so will they, is that how that'll work? It'll be a, uh, an annual grant process for that five or six year period? What, what I would, um, what do we have in mind right now is I think it's going to need to be shorter and it needs to be targeted and focused so that we are really having a, um, what's, what type of service can we get, where, where can we have the most impact? If you spread it out over too many years, I worry that it sort of trickles out, right? And sure. when you really award a number of organizations, is that, are they really getting enough money to do something? So the idea right now is to get the money moving uh, over maybe two or three years of that time period. Now, when they tell you the, the deadline is September 30th of 2030, that is, that is your hard, hard deadline. It all has to be spent and accounted gotcha. for. So there's a little bit of time before that. I would say early in 2030, we'd be 
trying to wrap it up, if not before, with all the accounting and everything else. So our intention, feel comfortable saying tonight, would be to narrow that, that time period. Uh, and they are, the guidance I've been given from uh, the federal government is um, trying to move that money sooner rather than later. So maybe not wait a couple of years and then do it, just start, start it moving now and then potentially be done with it before, well before the 2030 deadline. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions? Okay. Seeing none, I'll just close. Um, do you have a sense of when the dates will be set for the early March feedback period, public input period, and how will that be publicized? Yep. It'll be publicized in the paper, uh, in the Herald Times, I'm sorry, and uh, on our city website, things like that. I anticipate um, that it'll be in the first two weeks of March. So my Target goal now would be March 6th to March 15th, if that is, uh, or excuse me, March 20th. So that's what, that's a 15 day period of time. My goal is to get the plan submitted to HUD by March 24th, that's a Friday. So March 6th to March 20th is my current estimated public comment period. Um, that could move a couple of different days. We'll have it, we have to have a notice in the paper um, seven days ahead of that being available. So that's the general time frame, though, Madam President. <laughs> And do we have any concern that a good chunk of that is spring break? And um, it, it's a good question. Um, just ask folks to, you know, they can comment online, they can send email, they don't have to physically go to look at the plan. Um, and we've really made an effort to do a lot of outreach, uh, give presentations like this, have two public hearings, you're only required, required to have one. So okay. I feel pretty confident in the outreach we've done, uh, certainly, uh, happy to hear comments from anyone, but that's a, that's a valid concern, but not, not one I'm sure we can, we can adjust the dates on uh, very well, so we may just have to roll with it. Okay. Any additional questions? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Zodi. Thank you. Much appreciated. All right. Okay. With that, let's go to reports for council committees. I believe we have a report from Council Member Smith for the Sidewalk Committee. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Lucas, if you can put the kind of the front page of the report up. And the sidewalk committee, uh, I've been the chair for a couple of years, and uh, it's, been a it's really been a great process. I learned a lot about how this all works. And if you can slide down a little bit, and then we'll see um, all the people who helped us do this. Um, the sidewalk committee was comprised of myself, uh, Council Member Rosenberger, Council Member Rallo, and Council Member Bolin. Uh, the city members who really helped us out a lot, uh, Neil Copper helped a uh, great deal in advising and, and helping uh, Roy Atten, Hack, uh, Hank Duncan now is, uh, is kind of the bicycle and pedestrian coordinator. He'll be kind of le leading that at next year. Uh, Ryan Roebling did some uh, of the uh, legal things, and uh, Jane Fleeg from Utilities, Steve Cotter from National Resources, and Sophia McDonald from uh, Chief Deputy Clerk. Uh, it's so much information to pull together and to do things from year to year. Uh, without these folks, no way could it, could it have been done. Um, so if you will kind of slide down to where it shows how much money we, get, we are allocated. Uh, each year, and it's probably been over the last five to seven years, we're allocated about $336,000 uh, to spend on building new sidewalks. And um, the money comes from alternative transportation funds, which, which are parking meters and some parking fees. Um, it's uh, not very much money to build new sidewalks. So, um, we realize that and we keep thinking there must be another way to get more money and well we keep thinking about it and and really we haven't haven't been able to figure that out yet um, so uh, we have uh, worked on um, figuring out how to figure out which sidewalks we want to build so over the last year um, somebody in planning and transportation and uh, bicycle and peds helped us redo the criteria. And so we changed the criteria, and if you can show us the criteria page. 
it was uh, just a few items were um, used to kind of make that determination and then the city staff would make recommendations. Um, with the help of the city staff, they did the heavy lifting and I just pestered them. Uh, we enhanced and made a, a, a lot more things come into bear, a lot of social equity issues, where to build sidewalks for underserved areas, underserved populations, and I think we did a really great job on that. I will say that uh, I, I think, uh, this, is my, this is my last uh, official act on the sidewalk committee this, today, uh, is that it's kind of a living cri bunch of criteria. So in the future, perhaps it'll be changed and make it a, you know, a little better in different ways. But we really did improve it significantly. And, uh, and that was really a great process, it really was. Um, and so um, the, the report is 77 pages and it, is, it will be on the city website on, on today's uh, meeting. So rather than going all through that, and you can read it, a lot of it's really interesting and some of it's not so interesting. Um, uh, I will go to uh, just show you that the criteria is about, uh, is it a walkable area? Um, how dense is the population? How many people get to walk to work um, or, or drive to work? Vehicle counts, speed in the area on, on the adjacent streets, um, uh, percentage of renters in the area, medium income, um, underserved groups that are in the area. And um, so that, that was really, uh, has, was a great improvement. So after doing all that and looking at all the projects that might um, be available, um, the city staff, uh, Mr. Copper and uh, Mr. Duncan and Mr. Roebling and other people in, in the department, they came up and showed us that there's about, uh, I think it's five projects that we're able to fund this coming year. And some of the projects have already been partially designed from last year, and then this year we'll construct them. And that's kind of how it goes over a two year period. So for uh, the sidewalk projects, I'm gonna tell you about the ones that were uh, recommended by the city uh, staff, uh, by the experts, and that we on the committee looked at and we did approve them. So first of all, it's Adams from Kirkwood. There's construction costs of about $125,000. And Mr. Mr. Lucas, can you show then that map? I'm gonna make him jump back and forth. Um, so that kind of gets you an idea of, of the, the, you know, how far it is and, and what it's doing. And it's kind, of a, it's kind of a little bit difficult to understand exactly what that means, but you'll see that uh, it's, it's been planned and thought out very well by the staff. All right, can we run back to the, to the uh, allocations? Um, and so um, then uh, there's gonna be uh, Liberty Drive and it's a design, oops. And I don't think we need to jump back and forth to the maps anymore, Mr. Lucas, thank you. So Liberty Drive is gonna be a design and uh, that's going to that's gonna be $114,000. And then there's going to be a design on Overhill Drive from 3rd Street to 5th Street. And that will be about $35,000. And then there's a design on Smith Avenue, uh, kind of just south of downtown, which is a, a problematic area. We're not sure about. Um, it, it's gonna get evaluated and designed, but we're not sure if it's gonna be able to uh, be built because there's a lot of right of way and a lot of buildings very close. Um, so that's challenging, it's over by the project school. And that's uh, $12,000 for that. And then the, the last thing that's always included is each year traffic calming projects that can be asked uh, for by citizens and community is allocated $50,000. And unfortunately, you know, that it should be probably $500,000, but it's not. And so it ends up being a total of $336,000. Uh, 
um, in expenditures that uh, were recommended by the city staff uh, based on all those criteria that we tried very hard to you know, uh, make fair and, and, and do the right thing with, with building sidewalks. And um, so that is how, uh, in brief, uh, the sidewalk committee, that's the conclusions we came to and uh, we, uh, we approved it on the sidewalk committee and then tonight we're going to uh, vote on, city council is gonna vote to approve what we approved that, uh, on the sidewalk committee. And I think, yes, yes, Mr. Lucas. Just a point of correction, I, I realize there's a typo here. The project recommended on South Liberty to drive for 114,000, uh, this should read construction, not design. Uh, I believe design was funded previously. Uh, the recommendation is for 114,000 for that project. Uh, so this, that, that word should be construction, not design. Apologies. Thank, thank you for pointing that out. I thought that was a lot for, for a design, but uh, uh, you get nervous when you're up here, so sometimes yeah, I didn't want to go ahead and say anything. Um, so, um, so that kind of in brief is the report to my colleagues and to the public. And so are, if anyone has any questions, I would be happy to entertain questions from my colleagues. Questions from council? Council member Piedmont Smith. Yes, um, thank you council member Smith and all the colleagues who were on the committee and the staff who, who uh, did the, the legwork. Um, I uh, was wondering, is there still kind of a running list of uh, locations that are in need of sidewalks? Um, and is that, was that the starting point that staff looked at and then applied the criteria to? Is that how it worked? Yeah, th there is still a list of other projects that are out there. Yes, and that, and that these were the ones that were uh, after it got boiled down, these are the ones that came up that met uh, the criteria. And some of them were uh, construction projects from last year. So you don't get too much wiggle room actually um, uh, with the, uh, the funds from year to year. And um, do you happen to know uh, whether some of the projects on the list um, are in TIF districts. I know that in the past um, we've uh, mentioned the possibility of using TIF funds, that's tax increment financing funds, uh, for sidewalks. And so I'm wondering if um, any of the, the needed sidewalks, the, the parts of the city where there are missing sidewalks and that are on the, the long list um, are in a TIF district. Do you have any idea? Um, I'm going I'm to ask my other uh, count, uh, members of the Sidewalks Committee, but my recollection was that uh, uh, Mr. Copper uh, assured us that they look for other additional funds to supplement this so that we can spend, buy, you know, uh, optimize our funding. Um, and, but I don't recall specifically, um, you know, the, the response on that. But I know we talked about it at the, at the meeting. Is it Mr. Rallo? Uh, we didn't discuss TIF funds, but we did discuss um, MPO funding, Metropolitan Planning Organization funding, and um, really appealing for those funds, which are um, state and federal funds, uh, usually for roadways, but um, we've been utilizing them for side paths, and, and uh, they could be used for sidewalks. There's also the opportunity for utilities to join us. Uh, Jane Fleeg was uh, uh, there to, uh, of course, recommend at times whether or not these projects overlap, sidewalk, sidewalk projects might overlap with uh, stormwater projects and so forth, and there might be cost sharing there. But there was no specific talk about TIF funding, um, but that's an interesting uh, aspect, I think, to, to consider. Okay. Seeing none, um, we'll go to an opportunity for public comment on the sidewalk committee report. Um, may we have just a show of hands in chambers about who would like? Oh. Um, since this report is regarding something that's being considered tonight, shouldn't the public comment come during that moment? 
I mean, in other words, we're voting on this tonight, right? Right. So, I mean, maybe this, even this committee report should have come under the heading of legislation for second reading. Mr. Lucas? There is no item of legislation. I thought we said we were voting on it tonight. The, the council typically considers a motion to ex, uh, adopt the report and the funding recommendations. Oh, I see. Okay, we're just adopting the report, Correct. not, okay, I, I lost track. Thank you. My apology. But, Mr. Lucas, could you extend the invitation on Zoom to anyone who would like to offer comment on the report? Yes. Uh, if there are members of the public on Zoom that would like to comment on this uh, report and recommendation, please use the raise hand feature to let us know. You can find that in your control bar under the reactions button or the more button. You can also send a chat to the meeting host to let us know you'd like to speak. And I do see one hand raised at the moment. Okay, thank you. Let's begin here in chambers. Um, if you would, please share your name for the record and then you will have three minutes. Welcome. Hi, thank you. My name is Greg Alexander. <clears throat> I just wanted to say briefly that um, this is a long list of sidewalks that aren't being funded, um, just like it is every year. We are not building sidewalks that are absolutely essential for um, impoverished members of our community, neighborhoods that have um, segregated transportation networks where people have to walk on Walnut Street. There are sidewalk gaps on Second Street. There are sidewalk gaps um, on Adams, sidewalk gaps. And it's, it's a social justice issue. It's an environmental issue. It's a quality of life issue. It really needs to be taken care of and this, um, pathetic amount of funding simply isn't taking care of it. But I really do respect the work of the commissioners and the um, staff and, and everybody that worked on the hard job of deciding not to build 99% of the sidewalks we need. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Lucas, who do we have on Zoom? Uh, first on Zoom is Chuck Livingston. Mr. Livingston, could you confirm your name for the record, please? And then you'll have three minutes. Welcome. Yes, it's Chuck Livingston. I live in Elm Heights. I submitted a collection of photographs that I think Mr. Lucas can put up. And Mr. Lucas, if possible, could you also share your camera? Thank you. Mr. Livingston, please go ahead. I can't see if the photographs are now displayed. They are. Yes. Thank you. Um, you know, so last summer, I attended Councilmember Piedmont Smith constituent meeting that was also attended by Adam Wason. At that meeting, sidewalks were discussed. One of the mem uh, members public who spoke said something of the sort that, well, perhaps in Elm Heights, the sidewalks aren't in good shape, but in McDowell Garden, the city has done a wonderful job with accessibility. So I walked over to McDowell Gardens to see what it looked like. Uh, photograph one uh, is one of the first things I saw, an absolutely inaccessible sidewalk. Photograph two is a sidewalk that goes to nowhere. Photograph three um, is a, I believe, a um, public works project from the 1930s um, that is completely de decayed. Photograph four is a alley cut that's completely inaccessible. Photograph five is again a place that's absolutely inaccessible to anyone with disabilities. To the suggestion that things are getting better, photograph Five, sorry, photograph six is a relatively new handicap ramp in which a phone uh, pole has been installed. Photograph seven is a sidewalk. It's roughly between Don Griffin and Mayor Hamilton's house. See the new sidewalk. You see they didn't install a ramp to make that sidewalk accessible. Photograph eight is about a block from Mr. Volan's house. The apartment complex put in a new handicap ramp. You can see it's light. It goes straight into a mud puddle. Um, Mr. Rollo just mentioned utilities can do work on sidewalks. 
This next photograph is from Lincoln Street uh, at the fire station, the handicap ramp floods. At Hunter Street, there's a stop sign blocking it. At the um, playground, it fills with mud constantly. At the police station, it floods as well. The last slide I have is my budget graphic. The green bar is Adam Lason's estimate of $35 million to repair the sidewalks and bring them to code. The blue bar is the six million that was spent, I'm sorry, three million that was spent on 10 blocks of bike paths. And the red bar is the city council's budget. The Mr. Livingston, you, Mr. Livingston, you are at your time. Could you please finish up okay. your comments in the next few seconds? You're, yes, one more sentence. The red bar is the budget for the city. The bicycle path on 7th Street would have doubled the city's budget for sidewalks for the entire city for 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lucas, do we have anyone else on Zoom? Yes, next on Zoom is Eric Ost. Mr. Ost, if you would, please confirm your name for the record, and then you'll have three minutes. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Eric Ost, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak this evening. I appreciate the time and attention that you all are investing in this topic in this area. And I also want to say thank you for investing in pedestrian transportation infrastructure in the form of sidewalks. The need is great and the allocated funds are slim. The infrastructure planning and prioritization process has obvious gaps. A comprehensive review of this process would benefit our community. Pedestrian infrastructure is critical infrastructure, ostensibly usable by all residents of our community. How we choose to spend our limited funds has far reaching effects. When we overpay for an asset, we have less money for critical infrastructure. When we allocate funding for non-critical special purpose infrastructure, we lose the opportunity to invest in critical infrastructure like sidewalks. When we overbuild existing safe and functional infrastructure, we are unable to invest those funds in critical infrastructure. It's important to choose wisely using a comprehensive process that decorously and representationally includes our community. The council will have upcoming opportunities to consider and address the salient points of concern I have mentioned this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oast. Mr. Lucas, do we have anyone else on Zoom? So. Okay, and seeing no comments here in chambers. Okay, let's come back to council then for any additional questions. Council Member Rollo. I have comments, actually. Any questions before we go to comments? All right, let's go to comments. Mr. Rollo. Thank you. Uh, I am a member of the sidewalk committee and I appreciate all the members and their work and the staff. Um, we have a meager budget as has been uh, described. And in fact, that budget has not been increasing. Uh, it was frozen this year. Uh, it was not a, uh, increased by the administration. Um, and I think a number of us were outspoken about it. This is at a time when uh, inflation, of course, is making the, the potential for building sidewalks uh, with the budget that we have. We get fewer and fewer uh, linear feet of sidewalk. Um, so clearly we need more funding and um, there's, there are possibilities, as I said, of the MPO funding. Um, uh, th there's the possibility uh, of an increased sidewalk budget, which I, I would hope that we would have in our, in our coming budget. Uh, this this summer, but even if we doubled it, as um, uh, the the public noted, um, Chuck Livingston noted, um, w there is no possible way that we can that we can uh, attend to the projects that we have uh, to do. So, um, given that, it seems I think that, that this council and the mayor should consider uh, a bond for sidewalks. Uh, that that would be one way in which we could get a lot of the projects uh, attended to and completed in the near future. 
Another is to, um, um, b b besides a bond, I think that I'd like to address the misdirection of funds. I think that Mr. Ost alluded to that. That is, uh, in, in my mind, at least, the Hawthorne uh, Highland Greenway is a misdirection of funds. Uh, this is a, a, a unneeded expenditure of three to four hundred thousand dollars, which is equivalent to the sidewalk bu budget itself. And this greenway is already a greenway, and it already has a connection to Weatherstone. Um, so we ought to be thinking about ways in which, uh, as Mr. Livingston said, we direct funding where we're not getting uh, the pedestrian infrastructure that we could have had we spent it on other projects. And so it represents an opportunity cost. Um, I also wanted to suggest to the members of the sidewalk committee, and, and so therefore the council, I, I mentioned this during our discussion, um, what was presented was the algorithm, essentially, of uh, prioritization, ways to prioritize the budget. And I think it's good. I think it's, it's definitely improvement, and we've been, we've been improving that year by year. But what isn't caught within that uh, consideration uh, of that algorithm, and algorithms are by their, their nature limited, it are m m neighborhoods that built out in the 50s and through the 70s that, that are lacking sidewalks completely. They have no sidewalks whatsoever. Um, and so people there are essentially forced to walk in, in the streets. Um, again, this would be, uh, you know, what we should do is evaluate those neighborhoods and at least where there's a possibility of a collector street where a number of streets could uh, join onto a, a single street that usually is utilized by, by traffic and bicycles and so forth, that we implement um, pedestrian infrastructure of some kind, either a, a side path or, a, or sidewalks there. Um, so um, I think that that is my comment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So. Additional comment, Council Member Volan. Yes, I'm also a member of the Sidewalk Committee, although grudgingly, but uh, uh, partly because District 6 is uh, mostly built out. Again, the Sidewalk Fund was for building new sidewalks. District 6 is the downtown district, and it's had sidewalks built out more than any other district pretty much as long as I've been around. There's been, there is a project this year that is being funded in District 6, the Smith Avenue uh, block, where there isn't actually a sidewalk, but we could use one. It's very narrow, there's very little right of way, but they've managed to figure out a way to do it. Um, but it's important that we distinguish between uh, what this money is supposed to be used for and the need, uh, well, the, we'd call it demand too, but the need for repair of sidewalks. That's an operating expense but new sidewalks are a capital expense. And the money that, that uh, we've, as a council, have intentionally reserved for many years has been to build new sidewalks. But we've never had the ability, we've always lamented the inability to uh, use that money to repair sidewalks, many of which are worthy projects that Mr. Livingston presented. Um, you know, the first thing I wanna say is I don't think that we need a standing committee just for sidewalks. I think it was a mistake to replace a transportation committee that could take up issues like scooters, parking, traffic control, public transit, and the like with a committee this narrowly defined. Uh, the council, I don't think, needs to be deciding which specific projects are approved. The council does need to keep working on the excellent process designed by Mallory Rickbile, the previous bike and ped coordinator, which created a formula for prioritizing given projects, but that we left it to staff to decide. I mean, they have enough trouble picking and choosing with, from the paltry amount that we uh, have managed to, as a council, to encumber for this purpose uh, without, uh, to, I mean, so I, without any uh, disrespect to Mr. Smith, who did an excellent job managing the past couple of years, it's sort of the overall process that I think is, is misguided. Um, but that formula, if there's one thing that the council should be paying attention to, it's the formula that Ms. Rickbile created for uh, prioritizing sidewalks. And that's something we can do in the normal course of considering an ordinance if we're 
you know, not going to have a, a standing committee either on transportation or just plain sidewalks. But there's another thing that I think is really important to point out right now with this uh, issue. The money that's going to sidewalks that this committee oversees is not, I repeat, it is not coming from parking revenues. I'm gonna to read to you a paragraph from the 2017 Parking Commission report. It's been going on this long. This is on page uh, 28 of the report, and it's under the section about uh, neighborhood zone revenues. And I quote, city code required revenues from permits, neighborhood zone permits, to be deposited into the alternative transportation fund, city account number 454, calling for surplus revenues from the neighborhood zone program to be used to, quote, reduce the community's dependency on the automobile, unquote. In practice, this fund became the source of the city council's sidewalk fund, but the mayor has regularly budgeted and the council has regularly approved a transfer into the alternative transportation fund of non-parking related capital dollars for such use. Let me repeat that, non-parking related capital dollars for sidewalk use. In short, the report says there's a disconnect between the neighborhood zone program and the fund where its money is managed. The presence of interfund transfers is unrelated to the performance of the program, although it is included in this report's numbers. We've been deluding ourselves for a long time. The money that's paying for sidewalks is not related to parking. In fact, uh, that we still call it the, quote, alternative, unquote, transportation fund shows how unserious we as a city have collectively been about the sidewalk problem that we claim to be concerned about. Because we've associated in our heads sidewalk funding with other parking revenues, we continue to miss the fact that that idea is 20 years old. We haven't revisited the assumptions we've made about sidewalk funding. To do that, we have to revisit our assumptions about where we have also put too much funding in parking garages, which have never paid for themselves. In fact, by the way, this is the year, if, the, we, if we had 20 year bonds on the Morton garage and the Walnut garage, this is the year where those bonds should be paid off. We've been transferring $660,000 a year uh, from the, what was it, from the, uh, the TIF? From the TIF to pay for those garages. They've been subsidized the whole time. And they're expiring this year and I wonder what we're gonna do with that money once those garages are officially paid off. Maybe we'll devote them to sidewalk repair. Maybe we'll devote them to new sidewalks. We should be thinking about it. If we're willing to pay for those garages, we should be using, willing to use that same money to pay for sidewalks. We also have to revisit our assumptions about undifferentiated and underpriced meters, a program which is barely paying for itself, even though meters are generating as they have regularly since they were installed 10 years ago, uh, more than $2 million a year in revenue, and yet the program is barely paying for itself, let alone helping the other parking programs, the neighborhood zones and the garages pay for themselves. The neighborhood zone program doesn't pay for itself, or at least it doesn't pay for itself and sidewalks. So Mr. Corallo is correct, a bond for sidewalks is a good idea, but at the very least it should treat sidewalk repair as a capital expense and not prioritize new construction. We should, if, we, if we are serious about fixing sidewalks, then let's treat it as a capital expense. I'm hoping we're gonna see a proposal for such a bond this year from the administration. It is overdue, and we've been talking about it as a council for more than the past couple of years. But I think it's important uh, in, the, in this moment here where we're talking about the sidewalk committee that we at last give up this idea that somehow the committee is focused on the right uh, priorities. I think we've missed the forest for the trees here. The committee is, I mean, th as a council, we can revisit the, the formula for how, to, uh, how staff can determine what sidewalks should be built new. But as a council, we also need to really rethink our entire approach to transportation. And maybe we start by getting rid of the word alternative to describe bicycle, pedestrian, and public transit. Maybe if we treated it with the respect that the phrase, say, complete streets implies, that uh, it will also correct our funding to reflect it. Thank you. Thank you. I want to acknowledge that we're at about 25 minutes of our 20-minute period. 
for this for this time. So, but are there any additional comments that the council wishes to allow? Yeah. Yes. Is, with the council's indulgence, may we receive these other comments? Yeah. Council Member Piedmont Smith and Council Member Rosenbarger. Yes, thank you. Um, just very, very briefly, um, I, I appreciate my colleagues' comments. I think we definitely need a different funding source and we need to stop just talking about it but actually do it. Um, I just, just in response to Council Member Rallo, I, I do, and maybe I misinterpreted what he said, but um, there are some streets where I think there is not a need for sidewalks. Some streets do not have sidewalks, and some of those streets do not need sidewalks because they are very, uh, very rarely traveled, you know, very few cars, cars go slow, it's safe. Uh, and I even know people who live on such streets who do not want sidewalks. So just food for thought. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rosenberger. Very briefly, I would like to say thank you to Councilmember Volan for those comments. I second every one of them. Some things sometimes I think about sidewalks. Um, we tend to favor in the city, as most cities, um, the automobile as the form of transportation that gets 99% of the dollars um, from our city. In Bloomington, we, we remove snow from streets so drivers can get to where they're going. We leave it up to property owners for property owners to remove snow from sidewalks. Uh, this rarely happens in any, any kind of cohesive way. Landlords don't tend to do it for rental properties. Commercial property owners don't tend to do it in front of their businesses. We are saying that we prefer people to be able to get safely in a car and we don't really care about people getting safely uh, in on a bike or on a sidewalk walking. So many times when there's a lot of snow, I actually see pedestrians walking in the street, which is like incredibly dangerous when there's a little snow potentially on that street and we're making pedestrians walk there. Just another one of our many, many questions to look at there. A lot of cities do, do plow sidewalks um, for, their, for their pedestrians and for their residents. We shouldn't be penalized for uh, how we decide to get around town. We should, um, well our comprehensive plan actually says we should prioritize bike and ped, which means spending more resources on it than we spend on other modes of transportation. We have not equalized that yet, so we are by no means spending more yet. One quick comment about greenways is our experts in, our, in the city staff planning transportation and engineering um, made the transportation plan you know, years ago with hundreds of people commenting on where greenways should be and the, the ones that are getting redone are what the residents re requested and asked for. It's not necessarily about taking a safe street and making it safer, but that is part of it. Another part of it is making it more enticing for people who really aren't up for biking as a mode of transportation. I had my constituent meeting this past Tuesday and um, one man on there said he only bikes on multi-use paths for recreation because he thinks the city of Bloomington is too chaotic. And, um, you know, if that is a grown man saying that, like, think about teenagers, right, trying to bike in these places, or like parents with children trying to bike in these places. It's just a non-starter. So there's a lot that goes into our transportation plan, and um, I really appreciate that as a guiding document, and I think we need to keep following it. Thank you. Is there additional comment? If not, is there a motion? Madam President, I move approval of the Council Sidewalk Committee report and funding recommendations regarding the 2023 sidewalk, sidewalk funding. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, may we do a voice vote on this or do we need to do a roll call vote? All right, a voice vote. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you very much and thank you again to the committee for your good work. So. With that, we come to our first of two periods of public comment for items not on the agenda, for issues and items not on the agenda this evening. Uh, may we have a show of hands here in, in chambers um, of how many plan to offer comment? And Mr. Lucas, could you extend the invitation on Zoom, please? Yes, if members of the public wish to uh, speak during this opportunity, please let us know by using the raise hand feature, which you can find in your control bar by clicking the reactions button or the more button. You can also send a chat to the meeting host to let us know you'd like to speak. Great. 
If you have comments to offer here in chamber, please go ahead and approach the podium. Mr. Lucas, are we seeing any hands on Zoom? Not at the moment, no. Okay, thank you. Welcome, please share your name for the record and then you'll have three minutes. Hi, thank you. Um, my name's Greg Alexander. Uh, maybe there's a little interest in what I've been doing on the Traffic Commission or maybe these are just projects that I think could use a little sunlight. Um, anyways, I want everyone to see what happens when an activist and a malcontent is put on a city commission. This council appointed me to the Traffic Commission midway through 2021. You know me, I hit the ground running. I reached too far, I failed, I got up again, like I do. So the first thing I did was introduce a resolution to ask the city's traffic engineer to report to the council after fatalities. Um, you know, I think when a cyclist is killed while riding properly in the bike lane, maybe a certified engineer should come to this body and tell you what, that we have tools to prevent these deaths and we're not using them because of politics. I want an engineer to tell you that there are consequences to political processes that prioritize driver entitlement over safety. Um, that proposal failed, but you know, a lot of credit to my fellow commissioners. They thought the idea was worth something. Uh, so instead we passed a resolution asking the engineer to report just to the commission. And even though we don't really have that authority, uh, the engineer has been very cooperative and he has already reported about three deaths. And once when a cyclist was killed in a bike lane, he said exactly what I wanted you to hear. You didn't hear it, but at least he said it. That's something, right? Then I tried to lower the speed limit on all city streets to 25 to comply with the transportation plan, to increase safety and to improve efficiency. I use Rogers Street as an example where there have been six projects targeting 20 but for each one, as a matter of routine, they've installed brand new signs that say 30. Staff had a lot of concerns, some of which even I would call reasonable, um, but they did lower the speed limit on two streets, Rogers and Indiana Avenue. Again, I failed, and again, staff managed to salvage a bit of progress. Then I addressed the beeline closure in front of City Hall. It was closed for eight months, starting last January. I thought engineering should regulate this sort of closure under an existing ordinance, but the administration believes that um, there should be no limits on parks' ability to screw over cyclists and pedestrians. I failed, um, but there were two results. First, a detour with barricades was installed for the, uh, the last three months of that eight-month closure. Second, parks voluntarily instituted a policy that there will now be a modicum of public process to approve the negligently substandard detours that parks will misadministrate. Transparency, better than nothing? But in the middle of all that, a few council members were egging on a neighborhood association to help stage a demonstration of what power looks like. While I am toiling away, going through channels, trying to convince people, build consensus, and spark institutional change, I was treated to this lesson in power. Well, y'all, I'm telling you, this kind of use of power has consequences. If I had power, the city would act on the lessons we learned from three people killed by city roads last year. If I had power, certified transportation engineers would oversee our premier bike and ped transportation facility. But I don't have power. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Mr. Lucas, do we have any requests on Zoom? No, I don't believe so. And is there anyone else here in chambers? Welcome, if you would please state your name for the record and then you'll have five minutes. Hi, my name is Donia Zandi. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, and I had a quick question for uh, Councilman Volan. Is that correct? Am I pronouncing that correctly? I am, but this is not a time for back and forth. Oh. Right, this is an opportunity for public comment, not a oh. time for dialogue and questions. Okay. Um, I. Just want to make a quick public comment. Um, I had a concern about why um, we needed to establish a prison or a new jail um, in the Monroe County in the first place. I noticed from your report that you said that they were looking to expand um, and potentially move it around the Greenfield area. Um, and I, it's just concerning to me that we even need a bigger one. Um, I don't understand what the issue is currently with our current jail system. Um, and also, I. I guess this is kind of a question, but more of a comment to how we could allocate the resources that we were instead going to put towards that new jail, how we could actually allocate those funds to the upkeep of the prison and how to maintain um, and I guess establish relationships with the prisoners themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments here in chambers? Mr. Lucas, anyone on Zoom? 
Yes, on Zoom we have Eric Ost. Mr. Ost, um, please confirm your name for the record, and then when you do, you'll have five minutes. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, my name is Eric Ost, and I appreciate this opportunity to speak uh, again this evening. Um, there's a notion that delegation is an admirable characteristic of authority. As the Bloomington Common Council, you're bestowed with the privilege and responsibility of playing the role of a co-equal authority of our community's local government. With that privilege comes an opportunity to, do, to delegate specific responsibilities to adjunct bodies like boards and commissions. However, you are bestowed with fundamentally important fiduciary duties as well. And addressing and fulfilling these duties requires concerted, timely investments of attention, focus, and effort. The Common Council is the forum and perhaps the only truly comprehensive and representational forum where members of our community can receive an audience and provide meaningful input to inform critical decisions that broadly affect our city. Delegation of decision-making authority to adjunct bodies should be carefully planned and open for periodic review. A natural question we may want to consider at times like these is, at what point does delegation becomes a form of dereliction? And I say that with all due respect. I thought about whether I would use that word or not, and I hope you don't take that in the wrong way. But I ask you to consider all the meanings of that word. Please be aware and mindful when making decisions related to delegation of authority and be open to the review and reform of those decisions when evidence and the experience of our community suggests is prudent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ost. Mr. Lucas, do we have additional individuals on Zoom? No, I don't believe so. And any additional comments in chambers? Okay, seeing none, that'll conclude our first period of public comment. We'll move now to appointments to boards and commissions. We have three committees that have been doing this work. Um, I'd like to suggest we start with interview team A. Are there any appointments? Council Member Sandberg. I am team C. I am, I'm sorry. <laughs> team A. <laughs> yes, we're here. Thank you, team A. <laughs> See how efficient we are? No. Um, I'd like to make a motion, and if it's okay with the chair, we have one, two, three, four different commissions, and I'd like to nominate all of them at the same time, or make a motion to accept them. For Animal Control Commission, we want to reappoint Chris Hazel to seat C2. For the Commission on Aging, we want to reappoint David Jennings to seat C4. For the Housing Quality Appeals Board, we wish to reappoint Susie Hamilton to seat C1 and Diana Opata to seat C3. And for the Urban Enterprise Association, we wish to reappoint Felissa Spinelli for seat C2. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, interview team A. Interview v team B. Madam Chair, um, before I read them, I just wanted to say about public comment that I want to encourage people who ask rhetorical questions to email any of us or to contact right. the council office so that we can respond to questions which we Thank can't you. normally answer during feedback. <laughs> Nevertheless, I think it was uh, worth, worth saying. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to move uh, the following uh, appointments to boards and commissions for the Community Advisory and Public Safety Commission to appoint Matthew Needler to seat C8 and to reappoint Shelby Ford to seat C11. For the Environmental Commission to appoint Kristen Mann to seat C1 and Corinna Tankersley to seat C2. And for the Bicycle and Pedestrian Safety Commission to appoint Polly Terracone to seat C2. Thank you, and is there a second? It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, interview team B. Thank you. Interview team C. 
Yes, Madam President, we have two appointments to recommend this evening. For the Bloomington Arts Commission, we would like to appoint Robert Shakespeare to seat C1, and for the Commission on the Status of Children and Youth, to appoint Aaron Reynolds to seat C3. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it, thank you. I understand we have uh, four mayoral recommendations as well. Yes, I move that um, Sam DeSolar, Elizabeth Mitchell, and Raynard Cross, and Matthew Seaton uh, be appointed to the Historic Preservation Commission. Mr. Lucas, uh, just to Second. check myself, is, thank you. Is that phrased properly or are we approving appointments? I, I may need to defer to the clerk on this. If these are mayoral appointments that require council approval, uh, the motion may need to be phrased as approval of these appointments. Um, if these are seats that the council makes advisory appointments to, uh, appointment would be appropriate. But if I'm understanding correctly, these may be. These are uh, mayoral appointments, or these are mayoral appointments that the council needs to approve before they're finalized. So we would need to move approval of the, the following mayoral appointments that Council Member Rollo has read. I, I make that motion. And I believe we had a second. Well, I, I'd like to ask a question before I second it. Question away. Well, uh, so, I mean, we just approved appointments, council appointments uh, to council seats, but we also have to approve mayoral appointments to, I mean, isn't the Historic Preservation Commission all mayoral appointments? Yes, um, for voting members. And since they are voting members that the mayor appoints, you do have to approve those appointments. It's OK, but these are not the, the same as these the advisory the members that are appointed by council that do not have votes. That is correct. I, I will just add, in case it's helpful, the Historic Preservation Commission, to my knowledge, is the only board that requires council approval for mayoral appointments, so it's an oddity. Uh, these are appointments that the mayor has made uh, and the council approves. I will second the motion by Mr. Rollo. Thank you. And I believe Mr. Rollo has a question. I do, for the clerk. I see that th three of the four were appointed by the mayor uh, in January of 2023, but Matthew S Seddon Seedon has been was appointed in August on August 24th of 2021, and yet has not been confirmed by us. Is, um, what is the status of Matthew Seddon? Is he? It, he has been serving on the commission, and I think it was an oversight through um, our offices between the mayoral and council and clerk's offices. Okay. So, for the clerk's part, I apologize. Um, and we'll go from there. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I thought it might be a typo, so. Nope. Uh, very good, thank you. I, sorry, it, point of clarification, was that appointment made in 2021? I do recall the council approving appointments last the, year. Was that not included? The council did approve several uh, mayoral appointments, but that one was missed. We went back through and checked our minutes and records, and we could not find a record of you having approved that appointment, so we want to make sure that you get it in tonight if you choose to do so. In, in that event, I, I would recommend a motion to both approve and ratify these appointments of the mayor, uh, given that he's been serving. Uh, ratification would be appropriate when the council would have been able to approve this at that time. So if the council wishes to approve this, I'd, I'd suggest a motion to approve and ratify these. these then I'll make that motion to approve and ratify. I'll Thank second you. it. Thank you. It has been moved and seconded. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, everyone, and thank you especially to the residents who are serving on these commissions. Much appreciated. Okay. With that, we move to legislation for second readings and resolutions. Madam President, I move that resolution 2304 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Will the clerk please read? Yes, a resolution authorizing the 2023 expanded outdoor dining program in the downtown corridor. The synopsis reads as follows. Resolution 2304 authorizes renewal of the expanded outdoor dining program in the downtown corridor. 
The program as renewed in this resolution provides for the continued use of parklets and Kirkwood Avenue for additional seating space from April 3rd, 2023 through October 1st, 2023. As required by Ordinance 2201, passage of this resolution also explicitly adopts fees for the 2023 program. Thank you. Madam President, I move that Resolution 2304 be adopted. Second. And I believe we have colleagues from Economic and Sustainable Development with us this evening. Uh, yes, I am Chaz Mottinger. I am the Special Project Manager of the Economic and Sustainable Development Department. So I just wanted to talk about the expanded outdoor dining program tonight and go through it with you. Um, first up is a brief history. So the program consists of 2.5 blocks of Kirkwood Avenue closed and converted to allow for expanded din outdoor dining and a pedestrian thoroughfare. And parklets, parklets which expand outdoor dining and parking spaces closed off by orange jersey barriers directly outside the participating businesses in the downtown area. This program was first passed in 2020 to give restaurants relief from internal capacity constraints and continued through 2022. City staff recommends passing this resolution to continue the expanded outdoor dining program for another season, shortening the program from April 3rd this year to October 1st. The blocks of Kirkwood included in the proposed Kirkwood closure program for 2023 would stay the same as last year with an optional change from 2022. These blocks we recommend to close are a full closure, full block closure between Dunn Street and Grant Street, the west half of the block from Washington Street to Walnut Street, in which the alley would remain open, and a full block between Indiana Ave and Dunn Street, which could be an optional, um, could be an option to leave it open. The 2023 expanded outdoor dining program would again require participating businesses to pay fees of $500 to $3,500, depending on the specific program and size of business as outlined in the program guidelines. So again, the adjustments are shortening the season, eliminating March and October from last year, and we are requiring for the parklets a beautification requirement. And optional again would be removing the Kirkwood block closure between Indiana Ave and Dunn if you so choose. So the adjustments are relatively minimal as we believe the consistency of the program is vital and helps align expectations. The per and I forgot about this. <laughs> I made this a nice PowerPoint, okay. So um, yeah, short in season. And then the adjustments, again, are minimal because we believe in the consistency. And then uh, the proposed resolution would allow the continuation of the expanded outdoor dining program for purposes of continued economic enhancement, vibrancy, and sustainability in our pedestrian-friendly community. The program is not without issues, and we acknowledge that. We have listened to feedback from the various stakeholders to make a thoughtful recommendation. We want to use this year as an opportunity to make improvements, gather data about the fiscal impacts, and garner more feedback. We also want to address issues other non-participating businesses or uh, places on Kirkwood may have. The fiscal impacts are inconclusive as we do not have specific data yet and will not for another three to five weeks. Having another year to make comparisons would help us full, make a fully informed decision on the future of this program. And I just want to take you real quick through a Downtown Bloomington Inc. survey in which the majority support the continued um, closure and parklet program, as well as a public survey um, where um, again, the majority supports the closures and the parklet program as well. So we appreciate the council's timely review and approval of this recommendation to give businesses time to prepare their people power and other requirements. I look forward to any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Crowley, did you have anything to add or no? Okay. With that, let's come to council for questions. Council member Rollo. Well, um, just a basic question. Is there a map you could display that you could you could show what's closed and what's not. I mean, you described it, but it would be useful to actually have a visual. Perhaps someone could yes, dis I believe, display. Yeah, I know it's only a few blocks, but you know. So I can I can point out if 
Mr. Lucas doesn't mind kind of <laughs> showing. So we, the recommendation is the same as last year, so it's 2.5 blocks. The first one would be from Indiana Ave to Dunn Street. Mm -hmm. So right there. The second one would be from Dunn to Grant. And then if you go down closer to the square, it's a half block from Walnut to um, not quite Washington Street, but that alleyway behind the book corner. So right there. It also aligns. So it's the Best Creek Chumley would be left open. It's basically where farm is that it ends. So it's a half block. OK, thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. I, if I could just follow up. So th this stretch that of cl closure um, is ostensibly to help restaurants because the parklets are good for dining, but um, certain businesses find it limiting that, that may be not benefiting from that closure. Um, and there's a, a church or a couple churches that are, that, uh, are affected as well. Um, have you engaged them, and, and um, what do you have to say about the objections? We have been really thoughtful about this. Um, it's why we've taken, we've done our due diligence in getting feedback and hearing all the issues associated with this problem. I will note that every year we've had this, this it's been three years and we've made improvements every year. So we would continue to um, do that and work with places that have real issues. So if there's um, ADA compliancy issues or anything, we're willing to um, you know, find creative solutions to help them out because we, we do want to listen and um, make sure that we are representing um, the businesses and all the organizations as well as we can. Thank you. Council Member Volan and Council Member Sims. Yeah, I wanted to focus first on the half block that's being closed. So uh, initially, it was the whole block. I know there was at least one merchant who complained about it. How did you solve that problem? Why, why did you decide to close only the half block? That is before my time here. So I'm, I don't know if Alex can speak to that. Well, as far as I know, I that. thought it was always a half block. Is that not correct? So I'll let Mr. Crawley answer that one. That'd be great. Alex Crowley. Hello, director. Mr. Crowley. <laughs> uh, Mr. Crowley did it. You got um, used to it, Mr. Yes. Uh, I actually um, believe that, well, I think what you're asking is was there ever a time when the entire block was closed? Um, Both width and length. I mean, yeah. It's, it, the half block is closed all the way like that, but I mean, the alley's open. The alley right? is open, Ac access into the alley. And I, and I think that uh, when we launched, originally in 2020, uh, we never launched with anything other than that half block. I think, uh, now how we got to that, uh, honestly, I, I can't remember. Well, the reason I asked is because it was a concern to the book corner. Uh, they wanted to be able to access, uh, to, to get deliveries, and it wasn't until we collectively opened up the alley that they were able to to access their, their business. With, I mean, otherwise they would have had deliveries having to stop on Walnut. So. I mean, how do we decide to open up the alley? Well, the alleys will be still accessible, right? The, 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 the closure will be on the street. You're talking about what, how The alley is it had that access to, to the street. To Kirkwood. To Kirkwood itself. Where before it didn't. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't recall what that decision was at the time. I seem to, yeah, I don't remember, to be honest. Because with you. Uh, the, the reason I ask is because down on the other end of Kirkwood, we've got one restaurant, a worthy business, Lenny's, that uses the program, and one business, the Bicycle Garage, that doesn't prefer it. Mm -hmm. And nobody else is involved on that block. Uh, it does seem like uh, maybe there's a way, I mean, I'm, I'm, as you've heard, I'm no big fan of cars, but mm -hmm. even I think that they should be allowed through however slowly. Um, I mean, is there some way that we can allow one-way access westbound on Kirkwood and put Jersey barriers around the area that Lenny's is using on Kirkwood um, and, you know, like keep one lane open through there? I think that would require um, a, a lot more for this year. I don't think that's going to be doable this year, but I'll also note that Lenny's wasn't interested in a parklet. 
if right. the full block closure happened, they would participate. So there would be actually no need to, if the, the full block isn't going to be closed, Lenny does not, Lenny's does not want a parklet. So there, we would just. Well, but I'm not in. suggesting a parklet. I'm mm -hmm. suggesting actually blocking off the street with Jersey barriers. Um, because in fact, I think that the parking ends before, like they, they spread out a little bit beyond the, uh, the mm -hmm. parking on the side. Uh, is there not some way that, I mean, I, I get that we have the stanchions up that were originally put up for festivals and celebrations and the like. Um, I don't think that, I mean, I'm not averse to talking about a pedestrian um, street. Uh, it's just, I'm trying to figure out like how, because there's no alley access on that block of Kirkwood, either north or south, thanks to People's Park and that, Mm -hmm. uh, rise between uh, uh, Kilroy's and and uh, the other buildings, so um, it 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 does make it more difficult uh, for even deliveries to access uh, uh, bike garage, even though they have that alley back there. I think um, for solutions, creative solutions, I think we're willing to be open if the council should decide to have the half block there instead. I think that would. Be a recommendation. I meant more like one lane closure as opposed yeah, to. I am. I'm not sure about the one lane because I don't know if that would need. Um, you know, there's lots of players in this game. I don't know if that would need to go from the, the fire department and the chief and public works or anything because that's you know slightly different than what we've done in the past. So I just I can't really speak to that right now. But it, it potentially, could could be a solution. I don't want to say yes or no right now because I don't have that info to see if it's feasible. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I was wondering if Mr. Crowley could answer Council Member Boland's question. Oh, if, yeah. if, if someone, I mean, he's got the history there. I think that's an important question. And then I do. So. Yeah. Council Member Boland asked questions about lane closures, and she said she couldn't do that or didn't know about it. But you have the history. Yeah. So, so let me. Uh, can you go rephrase back to that, Councilmember? I would like to recognize uh, Mr. Askin's better memory than than my memory. Uh, going back to your original question on on the half block, um, it was his recollection that the reason that was done was actually because uh, CVS at the time was a source of vaccines, and the the restriction uh, of access to CVS was a concern, and so that was one of the motivating factors for cutting the cutting the closure off. Who uh, made that decision? Where was it presented? It, it must have been during our approval process here. I mean, I don't remember that decision at all. I remember um, the owner of the book corner expressing dismay over having lack of accessibility. So if that's the case, it, it, good or bad, it's news to me. Okay. So was it decided at Public Works, Board of Public Works? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'd have to go back and check the record. I have you know, no idea. Mm. But, Going back to the question of the east-west horizontal closure on that third block, first of all, as uh, Chas indicated, we, um, you know, our recommendation says we like the vibrancy of the street closure, we like the pedestrian side of things. Even if it's underutilized, we think that it has value just in terms of general vibrancy. So it would be our recommendation that we would keep it closed. Um, in terms of, I just checked with the uh, police, in terms of, you know, concerns about having one lane open, and I think the only concerns really from a public safety perspective, it sounds like, are that, uh, you know, you might have some confusion in terms of which direction the traffic is supposed to be going, and you'd have to be pretty clear with the signage and that sort of thing. You, you could theoretically put some barriers just on the middle, on the, you know, the middle stripe of the road. Um, it's not ideal. We wouldn't recommend it, but it's. I, I think it's uh, something we could consider. Well, I'm not suggesting. Uh, I mean, so let's talk about barriers. There's the the white flexible barriers on East Third Street between Swain and Eagleson that was put up specifically for public safety because there were. It was the number two crash intersection in town. People trying to turn left onto Swain uh, from the right lane of a. Of a two-lane, one-way street. Uh, I'm not suggesting that you put those types of barriers up. Uh, I, I, but I feel like, and I, I, if Mr. Sims will allow me to continue asking, that um, the stanchions were put up in 2019, 2020 in anticipation of street festivals mm -hmm. like the Fourth Street Arts Fair and the like. 
And then when the pandemic struck, it was the simplest solution to keeping the restaurants downtown afloat, like blocking off a whole block. But we're three years in now, and either I feel like we should put stanchions down the middle of the street, because it's clear that we only need, this, you know, the restaurants on the other side of the street aren't taking part, um, and then use Jersey barriers, substantial barriers, to protect the people sitting in the street. Um, or, you know, we should, uh, well, I mean, that, that's, I think, the solution I'd prefer. Uh, why not uh, put up more substantial stanchions when it's clear what the use pattern is? So you're, I think what you're suggesting is using the same model of stanchion that's currently cutting the north-south, uh, but running that down the middle of the, of the street. And or, or I should say, or and, including Jersey barriers as well, around the actual seating area. Yeah. So that way bicycles can go through the stanchions and use both lanes further down. Well, I mean, I think the pr practicality of that for 2023 is, is small, right? It, that, 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 that's certainly is something to be looked at for the sure. future. Um, yeah, I mean, my initial reaction to it is if we are getting underutilized closures and if the public benefit of a closure is deemed to be less interesting to the council than, um, than, the, than the access to traffic, um, at least in the short term, that, that's why we've proposed the option of, of just reopening that block, right? If, 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 that's the, if that's the sort of balance that you're, that you're looking at, then, then, then you have the option to reopen that block. We recommend closing it because we think that there's, it goes well beyond what restaurant is actually using it. It goes to just a general vibrancy and a general kind of pedestrian flow. So that's why we like it as a closed block. Um, but ultimately, that's your choice. I'll just say one more thing here. Um, the, I, mean, I don't believe it's a public safety issue from a, a driver confusion standpoint. I mean, this is a downtown full of one-way streets. We all joke about how every fall all the newcomers to town get the one-way streets wrong. This is simply restoring one bit of connectivity that might alleviate traffic congestion on all the other blocks. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, connectivity is also a... Um, priority of the city. We, we know that traffic flows better when there's more options for people to use. So, like, for that reason as well, I mean, that's when we restored the alley on Kirkwood, uh, on, or near between Walden and Washington, that, um, you know, benefited connectivity. Uh, that's what I'm going for here. Uh, as long as you don't have an objection, can we pursue that next year? Would you, would you object to pursuing that for next year? No, not at all. I mean, I think if it can be done safely and it can be, you know, there may be a cost in, in that kind of infrastructure being put in. But if it, you know, I think on balance, I think if it's something that, that would be splitting the difference between maintaining some level of vibrancy and allowing for some of that access that you're talking about, I think that that would be a, that would be a good solution. I, I have five do. words for you, Mr. Sims. Food and beverage tax money. <laughs> Thank you. Council Member Sims. <laughs> I don't know how to respond to that. Yeah. Are you going to put a convention center on Kirkwood? Um, that's use a, that money, not, use not, that not, money not, to pay for the stanchions. No, 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 no I'm done with that. Um, my question, actually, uh, what I recall when we talked about all this and parklets and sh closing off Kirkwood and all that, it was in response to helping our downtown restaurant owners to get through pandemic issues. Um, and we used some of the CARES Act funds, if I recall, and ARP funds, and made some loans, low interest loans, and to help them through the pandemic. For all intents and purposes, we're, we're through the pandemic with regard to that. Why are we continuing to, to wish to close Kirkwood? And what say you to that? Um, we believe that the benefits are still vibrancy and economic development and um, sustainability. It's much more pedestrian friendly. And, um, you know, I think it's a vision for Bloomington that we uh, encourage those things. And so it, we've found that there still is economic development benefits to that. And I don't know if Alex wants to speak more on this, but we have found that, um, yes, despite 
being out of a public health emergency, there are still benefits to this program. And a lot of the feedback from the public echoes that with the vibrancy and quality of life that it increases by having Kirkwood and the parklets. Okay, and the feedback from the public that you refer to, what is that? Is that just the survey of the yes, vendors also, down there? Well, yeah. What are we talking, 30, yes. 30 people or something like uh, that? A thousand, a thousand some people, people. yes. Okay. And, and and in answering uh, Council Member Volans and yours, Council Member uh, Sims, we do really want to take this year to really do a much more substantial study and see the feasibility of this, of uh, this program in the future. So we really want to think about these things and um, get more feedback because, yeah, a thousand people in Bloomington isn't necessarily... Um, you know, a super great representation, but we want to take this year to see if people and businesses, if it, you know, see how it works out. So um, collecting more data and feedback is really essential to really figuring this out. So do we have any data since 2020 to show how it works out? Do, what do we need more to do? And, and I'm supportive yeah. of, I, I want to support what yes. we're doing. So, um, but I think part of what we're doing is maybe setting some uh, maybe precedents or unintended consequences in other places, um, if that makes sense to you. Yeah. So what data do we have that shows it's better now than it was in 2018? It is hard um, to do, to, to say some of it, but for instance, we don't have the park mobile or IPS data yet to show you know how revenue with parking, how that affects everything. Um, we have gotten some kind of speculative uh, feedback from businesses and um, on their economic enhancement from the program. But yeah, we need to work on what those items would be. It is, because this is only the second, this would be the only the second summer that we're out of the public health emergency. The state of Indiana, Governor Holcomb, um, last March, he um, relieved the state of that. So um, comparing last year and this year would be better to then compare pre-COVID, if that makes sense. Um, I mean, comparing last comparing, year to a time we did do the closure as opposed mm -hmm. to future where we haven't. You, you right, want to compare we, we, those two? Yeah, we just okay. think more another year of trying to gather more data and more purposely doing that um, since we believe last year the program was relatively relatively successful um, for the most part. We are, we do acknowledge the issues that you know we have with this, and some organizations and businesses have. So that's why we are willing to definitely have creative solutions, like Council Member Volan suggested, um, working on figuring out how to improve the system is not something we're taking lightly, and to improve the program that is. So. We do want to look into that and creative solutions to ad address these things. And but we do need more data in the form of, you know, seeing how the how, what the revenue is and trying to figure out how we can really, um, yeah, study this. So. Okay. Thank you. And I failed to mention earlier to thank you for your presentation. Oh, yeah. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Sandberg. Thank you. I have a similar line of questioning from Council Member Sims with respect to uh, something, feedback that those of us that attended the BEDC annual meeting today got directly. Uh, I don't know about you, but I had several people who knew this was gonna be on the agenda tonight come and approach me. And I thought this was kind of an interesting approach from the standpoint of somebody said, you know, when you're deciding this, there are winners for this, people are gonna be really excited about this, and then there are some losers. And so I think the questioning has been about for the winners, which are the restaurants, which we were all very much in favor of supporting during the worst of COVID. I was wholeheartedly in support of this because we needed to assist them when you know the whole uh, social distancing was such a critical piece of their economic survival. But the people who are considering themselves the losers are like your retail shops, your places that can't put their stock out on the streets, uh, as easily as the food providers can. And so they're concerned about, all right, you know, it's great for, you know, some of our colleagues here along the street, but not for us. And then we have other entities too. We have churches 
who have congregants on Sunday. We have um, a lot of uh, hardships that were suffered during the flooding and during the Hidden River projects that really caused some, uh, some construction impedance from some of these stores. So I guess it's, it's fair to ask again about the data, not just for the public likability of, oh, we like to walk, it's safer, there's no cars, but from the restaurants themselves. Are, to we, are we to a point in the COVID crisis where they could honestly say, we're good now, we're fine, we can host our people you know, on our sidewalks, those who have the ability to, to put tables out on the sidewalks and inside our restaurants, that we don't need this accommodation anymore because I am concerned about the losers. And we may be hearing from some of them tonight. I don't know who really, this isn't a good thing for us. It's maybe great for the restaurants, but not for us. So any, uh, uh, any response to that about how we can collect the data from the restaurants themselves? Do we need to continue this accommodation for them? Um, I think we definitely recognize that we are making this recommendation with sometimes limited information. Like we don't have the whole picture, um, notably the detailed fiscal impact. But um, like I said before, we want to use 2023, which is hopefully the last year with any lingering pandemic issues that sh you know, might be there um, to build up a robust set of da data to inform next year. Um, and so, yeah, I think we need to um, try to get as much data from all sorts of businesses on Kirkwood and um, those participating. Uh, I'm going to let the Assistant Director for Small Business talk, Dee. Hi, Dee Delarosa, Assistant Director for Small Business Development. City of Bloomington. Um, when we talk about restaurants and their recovery from COVID, at this point, I think one of the studies that I've read says that 50% of restaurants nationally are expecting to lose money due to inflation. The restaurant industry is one of the industries that has had the hardest time recovering from the COVID pandemic due to losing staff. Um, they've just lost their businesses. They've lost their revenue. They're in a lot of trouble still. Um, I have, <laughs> I've experienced this before this, I was the general manager of Cardinal Spirits and I had a hard time getting people back in the door, getting people hired. I think that we really need to support the restaurant industry in this city because it employs so many students, it employs single mothers, it employs people of color, it employs immigrants. I think that the thought of saying that there are winners and losers is um, a little bit too black and white. I think that this program can help a lot of people, and I think that we need to take into consideration all of the people that it does affect, and that we are not taking this lightly by any means. We do know that there are people who don't like this. It causes a problem. But we will do, and we will listen to whatever recommendations that they have. We encourage them to come to us directly. Give us your thoughts, give us your opinions. We want to work with those people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And to be clear, the winners and losers, I'm just being the devil's advocate, reflecting back what was sure. told to me today at the BEDC function. Uh, but you know, that's clearly feedback that, that I received today. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes, um, I wanted to ask about the uh, beautification requirement for the parklets. Um, I love the idea because I um, also think they're pretty ugly. Uh, kind of out of necessity, we use that, that very bright um, fluorescent orange color, which is good for you know, safety, but, but not great um, for ambiance. So um, I'm interested in this requirement. Uh, I read the program guidelines, and it was not clear to me uh, what the requirement actually is and uh, like how much the restaurants that use the parklets would actually have to do and how that would be measured. Can you speak to that, please? Yes. Um, we do agree. It's, it's subjective. What is beauty? It's a very loaded question. But um, it's mostly to try to encourage and then require that they tr don't just have tables and chairs, but maybe a rug or plants. Um, again, this is a funny year because we don't know exactly how to measure that. This year we would like to figure out how to measure that. Um, I think that 
last year we started looking at other modular options for parklets, but again this year came too fast that we aren't able to propose you know, non-orange jersey barriers. So I think this is just to try to, we put this um, requirement in because a lot of people also agree that they're an eyesore, and so we were trying to encourage and then and thus require at least some sort of effort into investing into making it look better and more um, aesthetically pleasing. And we don't quite know what that is, honestly, and we wanna, again, with this year, we wanna try out some things to see if we can improve the program so then we can be more informed next year and be able to answer these questions. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. A question a little bit, <laughs> but yeah. Do you have some um, ideas from other communities perhaps that uh, might work here as far as beautification? If a restaurant just says, you know, we have a limited budget, mm -hmm. we don't have any ideas. Yes, we were working on finding some visuals that I didn't put um, in the presentation, but um, we are happy to work with businesses. This is partly what we do want to do is if they have questions about it, we can offer some solutions or some ideas to them. So um, potted plants or a tent um, could be um, an easy, potentially an easy and not super expensive uh, modification. Um, they also rugs, or you could use signage boards. A lot of restaurants have that at least, just some sort of signage or lights even, something to just kind of enhance um, the parklet into not just feeling like a parking space, but an actual dining dining area. And so. Can you remind me how many parklets there were last year? Last year there were eight. Okay. All right, thank you. Oh, that eight oh. businesses and then the six, 16 parking spaces total, right. to be clear. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Additional round one questions. Council Member Smith. Um, thank you for the presentation and uh, so looking at the data briefly on, on your report, there was about 50 businesses that were surveyed and 30 of them said yes and 20 said no. So uh, my question is, uh, can you characterize who said yes and who said no? Meaning, you know, are, is 30 all restaurants and is, you know, 20 all retail? Um. So we worked on that survey with Downtown Bloomington Inc. So Talisha, Cope, if I can call someone else to answer that question, she would better be able to answer that. <laughs> okay, thanks, Talisha. Sure, be glad to hear from Talisha. Sure. <laughs> Hi, thanks, Talisha Kopic with Downtown Bloomington Inc. And um, I uh, appreciate you taking time to uh, look at this issue. And uh, you know, we are coming out of the pandemic. Downtown's getting busier. Offices are opening. Retail's opening. More diners are coming down. So we thought it would be prudent to survey uh, actually businesses around the square and businesses down Kirkwood, and then also a general survey of Downtown Bloomington Inc. members. Um, it was eerily close. I mean, it was really split almost half and half of people in favor and in support, and um, uh, which was, and, but much more passionately one way or the other than in the years past. They either really loved it or really hated it. And, uh, but it was a mix of different businesses. It surprised me sometimes the retailers were like, yes, this makes it a destination. People come down here, they like it. Um, it doesn't bother us at all. Others were like, we have delivery issues. Uh, you know, they're ugly. They um, uh, so it was just a wide variety of types of businesses. A little bit of the difference, though, is is around the square you have different functions. It's like, how does the square function? You come down for local government visits. You come for retail and merchants. You have offices, uh, accountants. You go to see your attorney, uh, you have um, health and wellness services, uh, there are a lot of therapists up on the second and third floor, there are um, uh, just a variety of different types of activities 
around the square. And so those, those parking spaces around the square are pretty valuable for people popping in and out and doing destination shopping. And uh, um, so it's a little bit different. And so there was a little less um, uh, support for the parklets around the square, a little bit more uh, support for closing Kirkwood. And I think it probably has more to do with the way Kirkwood operates. It's very leisure, you're there. You're, the retailers along Kirkwood were supportive. I mean, it always surprises me. You think people are gonna say one thing and they say another. Um, we had a couple of restaurants that really um, rely on um, uh, their deliveries, uh, their regular customers who maybe only come down in the summer and, you know, just avoid the area. Um, we have other, you know, safety aspects were really important to some of the businesses uh, for closing that Kirkwood, especially that Kirkwood Dunn area, to uh, provide uh, more space in the late evening, early mornings. Uh, so that was kind of a nuance as well. Um, so there's such a variety in the downtown of how people operate. Um, I know it's a certainly a big promotional tool for you know creating downtown as a destination and vibrancy and activity, um, but it's it's a lot of shared space in the downtown. And uh, you know as we we grow and develop, it's becoming even more of an opportunity. You know, we've gone from 600 businesses to 950 businesses in the downtown now. We had 8,000 employees uh, 20 years ago. Now we have 13,000 employees in the downtown. Um, we have 12 attractions. Uh, we're really trying to package people doing multiple things. If they come for a play, then also go to dinner, go for a cocktail, uh, do some shopping. So um, it's a vibrant area, and there are pros and cons all the way around. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. And, I just want to, and I just want to add, thank you, Talisha, for that. Um, that the survey was, we would like a more substantial survey to really see the reasons why people dislike it. So we generally kind of know that deliveries are a problem, but we would like to take this year to, to see how we could improve, right? So for next year, if we wanted to continue this program in the future, um, because we do think that there are economic benefits and the vibrancy and sustainability are very, very important. Um, and so being able to really say, what are the problems that businesses have and can we find a solution as well as close the road and have parklets? So um, again, it's just being really thoughtful and having a more substantial survey with harder data and, and yeah, talking further with these businesses and trying to figure out solutions. We haven't had time to do that. So um, really taking this year to be able to to have that data and have more feedback is, we think, very important. That's why we're recommending another year of this. Thank you. Additional round one questions. Council Member Rosenbarger. Thanks. Do you work with someone on the surveys or do you all come up with those yourself, yourselves? Um, uh, we have contributed to the surveys, yes. So, yes. but there's not like an outside firm that you're using for evaluation? Uh, Polco was how we did the survey, but we wrote the questions. Yep. And it was just like the, the, the platform to get out the, the survey. So a lot of our um, surveys have come from the Polco public survey or talking to the public and the businesses ourselves or um, the survey that Talisha of Downtown Bloomington Inc. Um, we coordinated with her on that. So, and we have di directly talked to people as well and businesses, so. Thank you. Was there a follow-up? Oh, but yeah, okay. there's been not been an actual feasibility study by a, another firm or an outside firm. Thank you. Additional round one questions? Round one? Oh, that's round one. Okay, if not, I'll take a turn. Um, I'm, I'm struggling with a couple things, and I need your help thinking through this. So. Um, You've talked about the benefits of economic development, and I know what each word in that phrase means, and I, I think I know what that phrase means, but I want to mm -hmm. understand what you say. I understood that very clearly during the pandemic um, when we did have restaurants that could not operate at capacity and that had to social distance and that needed to meet outside. 
Um, and I do not dispute that that industry took a hit during that time. But the food and beverage tax revenue reports that many of us follow fairly closely, let's just say they suggest a rebound. <laughs> Okay. So what economic development are we shooting for, is my question. Well, with expanded outdoor seating for restaurants in general, of course, they're going to be able to make more money because there's more people and more seats to fill. Um, also, the vibrancy is part of the economic development, so it's not just that the restaurants benefit, it's that, as Talusha mentioned, some retail businesses also think that the vibrancy of a more of a pedestrian thoroughfare encourages people to wander into stores and to potentially buy things. So it's not just about the restaurants, it is about the, the whole of Bloomington being more sustainable, pedestrian friendly, and also encouraging people to um, not just go by car to those places, but to bike or walk. And in turn, there is economic benefit to that, just the vibrancy of bringing people into our town as a destination, think tourism. Um, we have the new parking garage. There, there are parking. Um, there is parking, and so if you wanted to drive downtown, you would be able to walk, and that's really an economic enhancement for some people. And a lot of our feedback, again, both businesses and the public that were polled, did say that it's an economic benefit. It made them potentially right, like buy, buy more, go into stores more that they maybe wouldn't have normally done. Um, this is speculative from a business, but they said, you know, that even last year, 20, they, their um, profit went up 25% still. So they're, with this vibrancy that the closure and the parklets create of this outdoor dining, it just doesn't affect outdoor dining. It also just affects our city and how people view it and they want to come mm -hmm. to it. It's more of a destination, think tourism. And again, um, just promoting that has that economic benefit. So yes, it's kind of moved past just COVID and more into the vibrancy, sustainability, and how that leads to increased business for our community. And related to that very point, you said, you know, we've looked at sales figures for uh, the retailers in the area, not the restaurants, but the retailers. I don't, I don't, I, it's no surprise that revenue for restaurants goes up with increased seating. Um, as you gather more data, if we extend this for, for another year, and you use that year to gather data, how are you going to be gathering data from retailers? Are you going to be asking for year-over-year -year sales figures? Are, because I, that seems to me, I think, to be a key piece of information for several of us. So, Right, yes, that makes sense. Um, I'll, I'll let, let Mr. Crowley answer that. We've had uh, Alex Crowley, Director of Economic Sustainable Development. We've had uh, situations in the past where we wanted to have fairly specific information from businesses and as you might imagine businesses can be hesitant to share that kind of information so I think what we'll probably end up doing is asking for perhaps directional non-specific right so uh, up tw up 25 percent down 25 percent up 50 percent try, try to put them in, in, in buckets of, of trend rather than demanding uh, you know, P&Ls from them for, for, for a period. I think that's probably the more likely way that we can try to get a, a better sense of what, uh, whether it's a restaurant or a business or a non-restaurant business downtown is going through from a revenue perspective. Okay. Um, thank you. I'll hang on to my next question. So round two, council member Piedmont Smith. Um, yes. Uh, the, 2019 transportation plan um, calls for uh, Kirkwood Avenue to be a shared street. And um, obviously that was before the pandemic and that was before we had, uh, you know, reached out to, to try to help um, our local, our restaurants uh, survive the pandemic through the Kirkwood closures. Um, but it, it seems that this should be revisited. I mean, this is in our plan um, a shared street would allow vehicles, but would be designed in such a way that they would have to travel very slowly and make it, um, therefore, a very desirable and safe place to um, use the street in other ways, um, outdoor dining, pedestrians, bicyclists, et cetera. Um, so I just wanted to inquire, what is the status of implementing that plan? Um, I'll just add to you real quick before I 
don't think I can specifically answer that. I think, again, Mr. Crowley can. But I will say um, part of the consistency part of this, since we've had this program for the past three years, if that were to be a future vision for Bloomington, having that consistency of the public and businesses expecting those closures would just um, help with expectations. So I just want to point that out. And Yeah, I mean, the, the, it's in our plan. So it's not like if it were in our plan, it is in our plan. So you're, you're asking about the transportation plan and the, and yes. the idea of having that be a shared street and what yes. is our uh, recommendation relative to that uh, uh, idea in the plan? Yes. Okay. I know um, it's a different department, but. Um. <laughs> yeah, no. No, I mean, look, personally, I think it's a great idea. Um, I do think that, that something like that is pretty significant. And, uh, you know, I subscribe absolutely to the idea in the plan that, that suggests that we should be revisiting Kirkwood. Uh, we had originally thought that perhaps we would try to do a feasibility study um, first so that we could, you know, kind of delve pretty deeply into what would it actually mean to take Kirkwood as it is today and turn it into the Kirkwood that's conceived in the transportation plan. I still think that's a good idea. There are a lot of businesses that need to be engaged very deeply with that. Uh, it's not something you want to do just willy-nilly overnight. Um, and I think the best idea would be to perhaps bring in a third party and have them really kind of assess, you know, what it, first of all, what would it take? Um, what kind of costs, capital costs would be involved? How long should it, should that conversion take in order to, you know, prepare businesses on the street for it? Um, and, you know, it, it could conceivably have an effect on the mix of businesses that are on that street. Um, and so, you know, you just want to tread lightly and, and make sure you're doing it carefully and not rush into something like that. So, you, do you see, well, I guess uh, from what you're saying, it, it, do I assume correctly that you do not see the temporary closures of Kirkwood as a replacement for the, the longer term vision of Kirkwood being a shared street? I, I would hope not. I think that the short-term cl closures, I mean, they came out of a, of a moment of pain, right? They came out of a moment of necessity. But the continuation of them, I think, lends itself to people understanding the value of a uh, shared street over the long term. So I actually think it helps to advance it, even if it in itself is not what the plan was defining. I think it does help to advance that notion. Um, I do not, we're not suggesting by any means that this configuration that we're talking about should be uh, made seasonal in order to replace what's in the transportation plan. That, I think, still needs its own deep dive and understanding. And, you know, uh, again, it'll take several years, but I do think that what's happening right now, uh, as you know, as we all know from, from policy decisions and, and tough choices, frankly, that have to be made, people have trouble envisioning something without seeing it sometimes, right? It, it's, it's, uh, it's hard for someone to wrap their brain around the value of something until they can see it happen. And so we th actually think there's value in a temporary uh, closure like this to help to kind of project forward what that might look like in the future, uh, but certainly not replace it. Well, that's good to hear. But of course, a shared street is different in that cars would be allowed. They would be. Yeah. They would be. Um, you know, we have... We have a kind of shared street design in the trades district, right, where you have, you don't have, you know, the sidewalks kind of meld into the street. The street's very fluid with the pedestrian. Um, cars see that and they understand, oh, this is different. I need to drive slowly. Um, it would allow for things like deliveries, so it wouldn't be a hard, hard block. There's a lot of value to it. Um, but we think that it would actually much more significantly bias uh, non car traffic, which is sort of the value of it. Uh, and that in itself is, is, is a bit of a change. All right, thank you. Additional round two questions. Council Member Volan. Yeah, um, off the top of your head, can you give us a ballpark figure of what it costs to install the stanchions in the street the, at, the, at uh, 100 block of East Kirkwood and the 400 and 500 blocks of East uh, Kirkwood? You're asking like annually, what, it, what is No, the, there was a one-time cost. We put them in for oh, the festivals capital. and stuff, oh, just I, the, yeah. I don't know off the top of my head. We can get you that answer. Was it a million dollars or 10,000? I would imagine it's probably, well, you remember it was done as part of the whole repaving. 
Right. So I, I public works was really is, is better suited to answer that. I could get, get, get you that information. Yeah, I like it. Because yeah. I, I don't think it's extraordinarily expensive. The, the issue is if we were to put uh, stanchions uh, east-west, there would be a much longer path they'd have to block off in order to make a lane. So that's what I'm trying to find out. Yeah. So yeah, if we can get that, sure. that'd be good. Sure. Thank you. Additional round two questions before we go to public comment. And we, the round three question is noted. Okay, but all right, let's go to public comment then. Um, how many in, ch in chambers would I like to offer comment? Okay, quite a few. Mr. Lucas, could you please extend, if you would, please go ahead and approach the podium. Mr. Lucas, could you extend our invitation on Zoom, please? Yes, if there are members of the public on Zoom that want to comment on this item, please let us know by raising your hand. You can find that raise hand button in your control bar by clicking the reactions tab or the more tab. You can also send a chat to the meeting host to let us know you'd like to speak. Thank you. And let's go ahead and get started here in chambers. Um, if you would, please share your name for the record and then you'll have three minutes. My name is Nancy Hutchins. I'm chair of the Building Grounds uh, Committee at Trinity Church. Our board approved a resolution, a resolution we sent to you a few weeks ago. I'm here to remind you of the request and the reasons for it. A little background. Don't forget us in this discussion. Trinity Episcopal Church is at the corner of Grant and Kirkwood. We're a beautiful historic building. We provide a lot of integrity and um, all of the ambience and vibrancy of downtown. We have been challenged by different obstacles to gaining entry to our building. The Hidden River Project and the Alley and Grand Street effectively closed us to traffic over the last two years, creating a burden on our parishioners not experienced by other churches in the area. Then Kirkwood was also closed in the summer. That's the front of our building. During COVID, we supported doing what we could to help our neighbors, you have never heard from us, complain. But now we'd like to weigh in with our needs. First of all, I'd like to talk about handicap access. Our wheelchair ramp, which provides direct access to the handicapped door of the sanctuary, cannot be accessed when Kirkwood is closed, starting at Grant Street. Um, when the street is open, parishioners can be led out of the car in or near the alley, which we share with Chipotle, Chipotle and the ramp and the handicapped door to enter the church await. When we um, do have the wheelchair access, we do have wheelchair access through an elevator at the Grant Street entrance, so we are not without wheelchair access. However, it's awkward and it's uncomfortable for people and they can't go directly into the sanctuary. Um, in addition, the summer closure of Kirkwood directly in front of the church means parishioners cannot park there, which is important to us because we only have four parking spaces for the whole church, and those are used by our staff. So we have no other parking. And this is particularly important on Sunday morning and for people who are infirmed who particularly wait to get those slots. So the other issue for us is um, access for fire trucks. This creates a real obstacle in terms of fire because the closure of Kirkwood creates a dangerous situation because you have blockage of the alley between Trinity and Chipotle at Kirkwood. That alley is blocked, the one that comes from 4th Street and goes directly down to Kirkwood. It's closed off. This joint alley and the alley behind our church are blocked throughout much of the day because of Chipotle patrons stopping to pick up food. And so at any point during the day, beginning at lunch on, you could, it's almost impossible to get through there. If there was a fire and a truck had to go down that alley, it would be impossible. Ms. And Gutchins, so, you are at your time. Could you finish up your comment? Okay. My, my final comment is uh, we would like for you to consider, we are not opposing the closure. We would like for it to start on the other side of the alley in front of Chipotle. So to leave that alley open, which would go directly across Kirkwood. Thank you. Thank you. And I neglected to remind you to sign in, please. Uh, you should have the ability to sign in right there. So add your name so our clerk has your name for the minutes. To do what? Sign to in? To sign in. Oh, down there? Okay. Yes. Okay. 
And Mr. Lucas, do we have anyone on Zoom? Not at the moment, no. Okay, let's come back to Chambers then. Welcome, if you would please sign in and then state your name for the record and then you'll have three minutes. Thank you, I'm glad to have the time to speak with the, uh, before the council. I'm Janet Stavropoulos, and I'm also a parishioner at Trinity Episcopal Church. Um, I wanna second a lot of what Nancy said. We have a lot of parishioners, like, well, like the restaurants, who are seeing their business pick up again, so is our attendance at church. Uh, during the pandemic, it was pretty, pretty empty, or almost empty, much of the time but now our services are approaching the size that they were in terms of attendance before the pandemic. This makes access to the church even more crucial for us, especially because we have you know, many elderly or somewhat infirm parishioners who use that front in front of the church to get to the wheelchair ramp or to go up a few steps into the sanctuary directly. So if the um, closure would start on the east side of the Trinity Chipotle Alley, leaving the front door of Trinity Church plus the wheelchair ramp completely open for dropping off, picking up, parking, that would help the church uh, immensely. It would help our parishioners, they would appreciate it. Many of them have not come to church because during the closure time, they can't get there. So that closing of that area in front of the church due to the closure of Kirkwood has, pr has uh, produced a disincentive to some of our most devoted parishioners to even get to be, to be able to get to church. And we feel that um, we need some relief from that. And with our position downtown as one of the downtown, only downtown church on Kirkwood, aside from the Christian church across the street from the Graduate Hotel, we're asking for that consideration. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lucas, anyone on Zoom? Not at the moment, no. Okay. Welcome then, let's go to here in Chambers. If you would, please sign in and share your name for the record and then you'll have three minutes. I'm Mark Haggerty. Um, I would like to thank whoever has helped us uh, uh, down at the uh, Switchyard Park. Uh, the, the rims are up, they're not loose anymore. Both the backboards are up, they're not shot out. And we're gonna get lights down there. Uh, Mr. Kiddo called me last week and we looked at lights that are gonna go on the court. And uh, so we'll be like, like the rest of the sports places in Bloomington, we'll have lights. Now, <clears throat> I wanted to talk a little bit tonight about veterans. I'm a veteran and there's about 2% of us left now. And uh, more specifically about draftees. Mr. Haggerty, just to be clear, we're accepting comments right now on resolution 2304. I had no idea. I thought it was public comment. No, no, this is on resolution 2304. We have a second period of public comment coming up. My mistake. Shall I finish or should I go home Why and take a shower? Why don't you come back for public during public comment time and let's focus on this I'm gonna take piece my of shower. legislation right now. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. And I see you're signing in when, you, when you're finished with that. Go ahead and share your name for the record, and then you'll have three minutes. Hello, my name is Connor Wright, and I'm an undergraduate at Indiana University of Bloomington. And I'm very heartened to see uh, the proposal to close down Kirkwood uh, once again um, you know, on, on the agenda. As a student, I have frequented Kirkwood many, many times. I've gotten dinner there, I've hung out with my friends there, and I know that my friends also frequent Kirkwood uh, routinely, and we do so because of the environment there, uh, because of the ambiance, which is a word that has been spoken many times over the last 30 minutes. And I just wanna say, I hope that we continue to close Kirkwood in the warmer months to preserve the environment uh, that is there in Kirkwood uh, because that's the reason that I go there. I, I love the restaurants on Forest Street and Third Street. 
you know, but I go to Kirkwood over those places because of the environment there, because I can traverse the roads without worrying about getting ran over by a car, because you know, I don't have to look both ways anymore uh, during the warmer months. I can just walk across the street and go to the next store or the next restaurant. And when I think about these things, you know, I think, what would I like for my brother and my sister to see when they attend Indiana University? My brother's going to be here in about six months, and my sister will be here in hopefully uh, about three years and six months. Uh, we'll see about that one uh, later on down the road. But I want Kirkwood to, to still have the same environment when my brother attends Indiana, Indiana University in six months. You know, when he first moves into his dorm, I want to be able to go with my family out to dinner uh, in a place like Kirkwood where we have the freedom to roam and to, to get ice cream, to get dinner, uh, to go to the stores and get a bunch of IU apparel that we don't need. You know, I want that experience for my family and for, for people in Bloomington uh, who are not yet here or people that currently reside here. And so I hope that you know, this resolution passes and you know, I'm really looking forward to seeing how Kirkwood evolves over the coming years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Additional comments here in chambers or on Zoom? Welcome, please go ahead and sign in and share your name for the record and then you'll have three minutes. Uh, my name is Galen Cassidy. <clears throat> Thanks for allowing me to be here. Um, I, I want to thank uh, Chaz and the team and then also Talisha and DBI for their work on the survey and facilitate the engagement with the, the city and businesses on this. Um, one quick note, I, I do have some insight into the, the, um, the half block that Uptown's on uh, regarding why it was closed. Um, another reason was because of a potential project in the CVS parking lot that needed construction access, so just throwing that in there too. Um, <clears throat> As a family-owned independent restaurant and small business, we're in full support of the proposal to open sections of Kirkwood to pedestrians and continue outdoor dining. From our perspective of having this opportunity over the last few years, downtown vibrancy has, um, over the summer, has been at its all-time high. When this first started, we heard complaints, number one, lack of parking. To be honest, <clears throat> you know, we weren't in favor of this when it first was being proposed at the early stages of the pandemic. However, our um, you know, minds changed completely once we were, um, started to engage with it ourselves. Um, we've seen a more total guest with uh, increased outdoor dining than any other summer previous. And to me, this, is, uh, this completely dismisses the lack of parking argument. And you know, I see if parking were an issue that we wouldn't have seen this many visitors over the last few summers. Regarding accessibility, I think this is a real concern, but something that we can be creative about. In the short term, maybe we can have a designated drop-off spots on the adjacent north-south streets to allow for a shorter distance to the front doors of businesses. In the long term, I think that this can be solved with creative in infrastructure changes to the street for the accessibility of both people and emergency vehicles. I've also heard it's, it's not good for retail. Um, I've heard this, but I, I, I really want to understand why this is true. Um, have retail seen a decrease in business? Uh, again, we've, we've seen more people downtown in the summers than any other time before, so I gotta think that this is driving traffic to other businesses as well, besides just restaurants. Um, you know, one of the biggest challenges facing restaurants and bars in the city are the summer months. Every business um, shoots for the same goal of bringing in enough revenue during the school year so that we can survive the summers. Uh, when student and faculty traffic has dissipated, outdoor dining, especially with a venue that is Kirkwood, is an attraction that has proven to bring locals out more and drive tourism during the slower months. This is a creative solution that we need to um, help support our downtown uh, economy. Council Member Sims brought up the viv um, you know, COVID being the reason why we started this, but I would argue that um, we are still very much in the, the need to recover from COVID, the National Restaurant Association did a study and, and saw that it's going to take three to five years for restaurants to rebound from the losses experience. So Mr. I would Cassidy, say- Mr. you're at your time, but could, if you could just finish up your last thought. I would say that this is very much needed. Um, and I just wanted to say one more thing that we often talk about closing the streets. Um, 
I'd like to, to think that we can talk about this as opening the streets and be creative with how these can be used for, for people Thank rather you. than just cars. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lucas, do we have anyone on Zoom? Not that I see, no. Okay. Thank you. Here in Chambers, then, if you would, please sign in. And when you're ready, please share your name for the record, and then you'll have three minutes. Good evening. My name is Bob Costello. I'm the uh, president of Kirkwood Community Association. Um, <clears throat> I want to say that I've been on Kirkwood for over 25 years. And when I first opened the business and I sat around with uh, other business owners on the street and Talisha, <clears throat> I said, as we came up with new ideas uh, to problems and tried to come up with new solutions, I looked around the room and there were often people that were there that had been in business for a while and they said, no, we can't do that. We've done that before. It can't be done. And I promised myself that no, longer how lo no matter how long I was on Kirkwood, I would not become one of those people. And today I can probably say I'm still not. Um, the response that the city had was very generous to the restaurants to open up that street and to allow us to seat outside. Most of us could not seat indoors, nor did our customers want to come indoors. The thing that we also provided was a sense of community at a time where people did not have that sense. We still provide that sense of community. It's not just about the dollars and cents. It's about people walking down the street with their dogs or riding their bikes or jogging and seeing their neighbors. Right now, we're supposed to be living in a world of more connectivity when we actually live in a world of less connectivity than we've ever had. Human interaction is not something <clears throat> that we all have on a daily basis. The people that come to church on Sundays are looking for that community. When people come to eat at Uptown or they come to the deli or they go to Nick's or they go to Lenny's, they're looking for community. They're hoping to run into Sue or Steve or Susan, but they wanna have conversations with people and that's what we're providing. It's super important to this community. So don't look at it just as, Economically, are these businesses doing better as a result? Yes, there are gonna be some winners and there are gonna be some losers. We meet every month down in Kirkwood and we try to answer <clears throat> the objections that people have to having the street closed. It's easy to say no, it's more difficult to say why. And that's what we're trying to address. If you can't get deliveries at Bicycle Garage, how do we get the alley open? And how do you, we get you to a meeting to discuss what your obstacles are? If you have handicap accessibility that's needed, then let's figure out a way how to do a way to do that so that your parishioners can rejoin their community on Sundays. So what I'm here to do is talk <clears throat> is to really talk for all of our members, and we as members said that we would like to have the street open. What we'd like to do is to be able to plan though. So coming in front of you every year to ask that the street be open makes it difficult to make the investments that we need to make to make the place look more beautiful for the parklets to look more attractive. I know my time's up. I appreciate your time and um, the Hoosiers started 11 minutes ago. <laughs> and thank you for that update and your comments. <laughs> but Mr. Lucas, do we have anyone on Zoom or anyone else here in chambers before we come back to council? Okay, seeing none, let's come back for round three. Council Member Piedmont Smith. Um, yes, I know the answer is in my packet, but I'm going to ask this question just for the benefit of the public. Um, and actually, there's a portion that is not in the packet yet. So this is about the fiscal impact um, of the closure. Of course, uh, the city has um, metered parking uh, all around the square and on Kirkwood. Um, so could you review for us, please, the estimated fiscal impact as far as um, lost revenue? Yes. I'm just going to consult my packet as well so I get the numbers right. So it's a little tricky. I want to point out um, this is all speculative. We don't have the park mobile or IPS data yet. So um, again, we're working with some speculation here. Um, so if you um, take the days that the meters would ordinarily operate, um, which is 151 days, excluding the Sundays and holidays, um, 
we can look at the at last year's program and that eight businesses used 16 parking spaces and generated 20k in revenue. And on the Kirkwood conversion, um, which is 2.5 blocks consisting of about 50 parking spaces, six businesses participated and generated almost 20k in revenue. So the total was 38 and 750 dollars in revenue. Um, so this is all speculative because again, we don't have the hard data from Park Mobile or IPS yet, but the meters generally um, generate, a, they can generate a maximum of 13 a day. So it's for 12 hours, a dollar each hour, plus the dollar fee to use the Park Mobile app, so we're including that. So $13 a day from each parking space. Assuming maximum usage, the opportunity cost for parking meters would be uh, 31K from Parklets and 98K from the Kirkwood conversion. So the total would be 129K. And so if the participation and closure areas remain the same, the overall fiscal impact of the city's partnership in investing in the participating businesses and the vibrancy of the town would be about 90K. Um, and so this represents the estimated public investment to promote sustainability, vibrancy, and economic development in our downtown. But um, as that is just speculative, we, this is also speculative that we don't have the actual data, so what we believe is that the affected areas could be shifted to the surrounding areas. So just because someone isn't parking on Kirkwood or in that parklet on the square per se, doesn't mean they aren't parking at all. So if we had the hard data, we could actually see these trends and really see what the actual revenue and what the actual cost um, is. But we, we just don't have that yet. So. Um, I hope that answers your question as best as we can. Again, that's why this year, being able to get that information um, and look at those trends is, is pretty vital. So, Thank you very much. Thank you. Additional questions? Okay. Council Member Roller? Well, it's more of a comment. I just wanted to um, tell the, ch the, the chair and my colleagues that I intend to make a motion to postpone um, consideration on this resolution, but I think it's helpful and informative for council members to have their comment, um, and that would give me direction too, and and uh, your desire to to postpone or proceed tonight. Thanks. Thank you. Can I comment on that non-question? Um, I just want to point out that why we believe a two-week delay in deciding this is just there's not gonna be any new data. We've presented you with the data there is, and in the two weeks, there's just not gonna be any new data to consider. Um, so this is, you know, in the two weeks, no new data will happen, and it will just, pushing it two backs will negatively impact the businesses who need to know if they're gonna expect this for this year or not. Thank, thank you, I'm, I'm, I know that you're probably not gonna be producing more data. I'm more concerned about public, more public comment and uh, more council reflection, perhaps on ways to mitigate, mm -hmm. to make sure that uh, harms are brought to a minimum uh, if we proceed with this, because there's clearly benefits for, for many. Thank you. Are there additional questions before we go to comment? Because I have a couple of questions, sure. if not. Council Member Sandberg? Yeah, my question is, um, having heard from the parishioners at Trinity, is there a possibility for any kind of amendment work on this to accommodate that request that was specifically made by the public tonight? Uh, so we got that um, letter from them a little late, but so we weren't really, we, I put it in the packet so you all received it and read it, because we do take that seriously, especially ADA compliancy, we're not, again, we're not taking that lightly, that's a real concern. And so um, we weren't able to put that in the recommendation, but there are options to create half blocks for sure. You have the power, like we, already, we showed you the optional um, block closure from Indiana to Dunn. Of course, there can be um, a half block or we can find another creative solution. Uh, we've gone to the KCA meetings with the Reverend there who's gone to those and he, we've talked to him about trying to find creative solutions because again, we're not saying that that isn't a problem. We, we don't want to negatively impact the church and they are obviously, we want to acknowledge that. So we want to find a creative solution or yes, an amendment to creating a half block or something. We're open to, to anything, um, anything like that. But so, yeah. 
Oh, and here's Larry. <laughs> <laughs> Larry Allen, Assistant City Attorney. I just wanted to know, actually, in addition to the to the possibility of an amendment, so that's that's one way of handling it. In the original ordinance, it also allowed for potential suspension in part of part of the program if there was an impracticality. So this is kind of one of those situations where we can have the city engineer look at that. And it's it's also related to the fact that we, when we looked at the accessibility in terms of handicapped parking spaces, uh, we also looked at relocating those around the surrounding area from Kirkwood to make sure we maintain that accessibility last year. And so that's something else that we could certainly entertain. So we could do it either by an amendment of this resolution and change the program that way, or it could also be done at a staff level under the impracticality portion of the ordinance as extended. Did you introduce yourself? I did. Larry Allen, Assistant City Attorney. Oh, you did. Yeah. Uh, my mistake. Sorry. But additional questions? Councilmember Volan. Um, well, I just want to sort of preface this by saying that I think I'm going to be supportive of a delay, not because um, there's a question about the, whether the program should continue or not, but the details of it, I think it's what we're, we're talking about here is exactly how do we continue the program. And uh, to that end, I guess, uh, can't we in two weeks get the cost of Jersey barriers, the cost of stanchions? Uh, we may not get meter data, but we can get other information that would help us make a decision. I mean, uh, uh, because the uh, proposal is to begin April 3rd, and you're bringing it to us in February, we've got a couple of weeks. Can't we uh, take those couple of weeks to, because I've got uh, meter data to rattle off that I'd like to harmonize with the data that Ms. Monager just rattled off. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, we can get some information. We, uh, you know, we can get the cost of a stanchion, but we cannot magically figure out how to get a stanchion installed in time to make it actually, you know, practical in 2023. Sure, but I mean, we don't, just because, um, Let's just take Jersey barriers. Let's say we can, I mean, Jersey barriers are what block the half block of the 100 block of East Kirkwood from the, between the restaurants and the alley. It's not stanchions, it's Jersey barriers. So that's working. Jersey barriers would work to block off the other blocks. If you look, and I want to show the map later, if you look at the 400 and 500 blocks of East Kirkwood, uh, the restaurants on the north side are using one whole lane, but not the other lane. The restaurant uh, and 500 block is using the whole south lane, but not the north lane. If we put Jersey barriers around them or all the way down the street, that would be a viable solution to keep one lane open. Can we not at least explore that? Certainly can discuss it. I mean, I think what we're asking for- Because it could be do. installed in June, if not April. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, I, I think as you, as you heard from Chaz and, and um, we believe the 2023 is, is a good time to kind of figure stuff out, right? We are, it's sort of the first year that we're barely out from a, from a health perspective, but we're really not out of the pandemic as you heard from some of the, the businesses. What we believe is, you know, it's a good year to have some clean, clean information. It's very hard to compare a business's revenue this year versus last year, because last year was not typical uh, necessarily, but maybe, in, you know, maybe we get a better read of things like that. Um, you know, rather than start to kind of like chop down, compromise, cut down, what we feel like we should try to do is find creative solutions to, to, to issues like, like the church. You know, those are very clear. And again, as Chad said, we got those late. But basically do what we've done in the past, set it up, get a view of what that actually looks like for a season when we're actually paying it, able to pay attention to it, which we haven't been, done, been able to do for the last couple of years do some real analysis and serve up a recommendation with a little bit more, um, you know, uh, uh, analysis at the end of the season, right? So, so I really would recommend, I would hesitate and, and really not recommend that we try to just chop this thing down uh, here and there and here and there, uh, but rather we just kind of go at it, own it, figure out what it looks like in, in, in a normal year, if you can call it that, and then make a decision at the end of the season, well, how do we want to keep going after that? that that's our recommendation. That's the thrust of our recommendation. I appreciate that. I, I don't entirely agree, but I'm mostly, I think we're all trying to do the right thing here, and I think that uh, we can get a solution that is, uh, I, I, I'm not sure I'd agree with your characterization that um, uh, 
it's too hard to be more precise. Uh, I think we can make some reasonably minor changes this year that will make that will accommodate everyone in our mutual goal of a truly shared and complete street. So, uh, yeah, I guess what I you know I would say in response is there's a difference in terms of vibrancy in terms of what the student was talking about and in. There's a difference between walking down the middle of a closed block and walking down half a closed block and have the other you know, block, part of the block. I mean, it's just a different level of, of, of commitment to what we're trying to accomplish. So here, you're right? saying that we should maybe widen the Beeline Trail to be at the width of a two-lane street? I mean, everybody's perfectly fine accommodated on a, that's a width of a single lane of street. It's about, you know, it's just about feel, right? And it's hard to put your finger on, and I know it sounds a little, you know, touchy-feely, but, but really, like, I mean, I would argue that if you were to close half a block along the yellow line mm -hmm. and say, is, does this feel the same way as the whole thing is closed and you can wander around and not worry about crossing the street and getting hit by a car, I, I would argue it, most people would see a difference. And I think what we're trying to do is, is really lean into a summertime feel downtown where it just feels like it has and what people really have sparked to. And I think if you start to chop it down, you, you start to lose it and I think at some level you might just sort of paint yourself into a place that's like, why are we even doing this? I'll, I'll, we'll agree to disagree on that point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Additional round three questions. Councilmember Ravallo. Yes, uh, forgive me if this has been asked already, but have you gotten a response from emergency responders in terms of access? Did, have they... Yeah, they've been comfortable in the past, and, the, and so, uh, yeah. I mean, I think the, the, the one time, we have to keep an eye on what happens in alleys, right? And, and, and you know, a fire truck is gonna just come through. If they need to come through, bollards get out, they go flying through, and if the lights get, you know, I mean, they, they, they're basically gonna get to what they need to get to. What we're so paying attention to, I mean, you've got, you, you've, yeah. got, you've got tables blocking too, so there, what, I mean, it's just not, it's not just bollards, and it's also alley ac uh, alleyway access and things like that. They've, they've reviewed this and they're comfortable yeah, they've, with they've it. Yeah, they've been comfortable okay. in the past. What we are aware of is in the future, next year, for example, some of the work, that there could be some compromise on the alleys because of like CBU's work, right? And we have to pay attention to that. Because so we have, there has to be access, right? So we are paying attention to that for the future. Okay, thanks. Additional round three questions. If not, I'll take a turn. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilmember Smith. Mr. Crowley, have, have you had a chance to speak with uh, the bicycle garage folks? And they're, they don't, they're not happy with the closure. And uh, I just wondered if you had chatted with them or somebody from the city had to try to resolve whatever concerns they have. Yeah, we have had, I personally have not, but we have, our department has had conversations in the past. I know that they've also expressed their, their uh, you know, um, lack of support uh, in, uh, to the Kirkwood group and, and to others. So we're, we're very aware of that. And, um, you know, I, if this were an easy decision, it wouldn't be, it'd be an easy decision. It's not. There, there are definitely people who are for it and definitely people who are against it. We just have to try to figure out what's good for the community as a whole. Yeah, and I, and I think certainly it's one of our jobs to try to, you know, be responsive and at least try to, you know, address those and th things. So, so, so I appreciate that. Yeah, I want to add to that is we've been going to the KCA meetings, talking to the businesses and trying to go outside of that as well to, to understand why people might have an issue with it because, again, ADA compliance or deliveries, these are things that really affect businesses. So... Again, we need to have more substantial um, talks with folks and really get to understand their issues with this to, to improve the program if this should, exi should exist in the future. So I just want to point out what Alex said. We are trying to listen and trying to find the solution, it's especially when there are the real problems, not just um, like or dislike, but actual issues that businesses face from this. Right, and, and, I, and I know you, got, you are all trying to do that, and I just uh, ask that you touch bases with a bicycle garage. If you haven't, and sounds like you have, but you might call Mr. Hollahan and touch bases with them again. Thanks. Thank you, additional round three questions. Okay. 
if not, I'll take a turn. Uh, and I, this might have been a better question to open with in round back in round one for me. But um, I'm curious how we're we, we've talked around this a couple times. But I'm curious how we we are defining success. If we get to the end of the season and we decide that this closure has been a success or these parklets have been a success, and I think those are two different things, how would we know? Uh, it's hard to quantify things like vibrancy, you know. Um, but what, what conversations have gone on in ESD about how you would know if this was a success? I think in trying to find creative solutions and improvements for the businesses and organizations like the church who have these real issues with it, I think working through that will determine if we're a success or not. I think it is going to be, um, yeah, hard to judge things like vibrancy, but again, if we have some real data to say with economic development, people um, you know, spend more dollars in the area and just all around uh, looking, I might, uh, sorry, I saw you moving out. I wasn't sure if you were trying to talk. Um, yeah, I think just being able to see if the community is utilizing the space still, if people are in parklets, they are in using the Kirkwood conversion, outdoor dining, being able to keep track of that, and again, talking to businesses, not just restaurants, but everyone, and really trying to fix the problems and find solutions. If we can solve some of those, I think that will determine the success. Um, and then the feedback, pulling more members of the public as well, and just, again, garnering more feedback and more hard data to, to see. It's not that um, this effects might not be that we should do this, right? We, we really just need to have the data to see how we should move forward. So that's up for interpretation once we have that, right? So I think the success would be just having more hard data, having more feedback from businesses and public, getting more specific and substantial um, feedback and data. Okay, and I'm gonna nudge a little bit more. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, gathering data cannot be success in and of itself. It's a tool that we use to make decisions. So again, what kind of data would suggest that this is a success? What kind of data would suggest this is a failure? Um, I, I think as Alex mentioned before, just some of the trends with retail businesses and um, where the dollars have gone. Um, can you speak? Yeah. yeah. Alex. This might be a weird answer to your question. It was a weird question, so go on. <laughs> well, success can sometimes mean the absence of failure, right? And, and that if we are able to look at parking data, for example, I mean, if, if, if we stack up the five reasons why people don't like it, parking, uh, revenue loss from non-participating businesses, you know, whatever, whatever that list is, and you're able to go in and you're able to do an analysis that says, okay, let's look at parking, right? Is, it, is parking suffering? Um, and if the answer ends up being no, then, then it's a perception, not a reality, right? We're able to kind of disprove a, a certain perception that something is suffering when it's actually not suffering. If, and this is complicated, admittedly, but if we're able to collect information from businesses, whether they are participating or non-participating businesses, about their revenues in broad strokes, because you know, with, with the with the thought that we probably won't get detailed information, but with broad strokes, and we can maybe triangulate that with other information, whether it's um, food and beverage, gross receipts, although that's pretty broad, right? Um, there there are other data sources out there which you know could be leverage. Uh, there are companies that actually I hate you know don't want to freak everybody out here, but if you know they track people's mobile phone movements, and so they can, you, can actually, you can actually electronically paint an area and they can tell you how many people are, are, are arriving and leaving from that. I mean, that's out there. Um, so I think if you can triangulate on some of that data, you can get a better sense whether these concerns are real or are they perceived. And as, as Bob Casella was saying, you know, sometimes people just are used to what has always been and if you know, we, can, we can use this period to educate people to sort of self-educate also to look at their economics and figure out, okay, which, what is the trend line, which has been very hard to define over the last three, four years because we're comparing ourselves against a, a bizarre period. But once things have normalized, what does that trend line look like? And in fact, is it helping to drive vibrancy during a, a slower period of the year? That's the kind of stuff that we are hoping to accomplish over the period of the uh, season. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Additional round three questions, or whatever round we're on now. Seeing none, is there a motion on the table or a comment, or shall we move to, I'm sorry, shall we move to comment? My fault, my fault. Let's go Council Member Sims, then Rollo, then Bolin. Thank you. Um, very robust conversation this evening. Um, one of the things is, is um, well, first, before everything get too tense, can we just add a little levity to things here a little bit? Uh, Mr. Costello, about community and people talking in restaurants. Very good, I appreciate that. But he mentioned three people. That means there's five of us that, <laughs> I, I, I'm just saying. Oh, I'm just saying. Um, okay, that's what I was looking for, to get some levity here. Now, I would support uh, postponement, um, as my colleague has suggested. I'm really not one of the people who say, let's just dive in and figure it out. I'm one of those folks who say, let's try to figure some stuff out before we dive in. And I'm not going to figure out everything, but I don't want to say, let's approve this and then figure out how to get parking access and accessibility. I, I, I'm just not comfortable with that. And what I'm looking for in this postponement, as I have in the previous years to vote to support this, I'm wanting to be in a more solid position to support this resolution moving forward. But things are different now than it was when we first addressed this. Um, yeah, we're still coming out of the COVID or, or the pandemic. I mean, I, I get it. There's some folks, in my, in my place of worship, it is still mandatory <laughs> to, to wear a mask. To come to, to come to our service. I mean, so that, now we're not downtown. Maybe we'd have a different if we were on Kirkwood. I want to support this. It's helpful. Um, I think there's some other things we can talk about. But I think a little bit more discussion, a little bit more input, um, a little bit more effort to accommodate some of the concerns that we've talked about. Um, I did have a question here. It says, well, there's some things we plan to try, and I was going to ask, well, give us some examples of some of those things you plan to try. But I think that would just, you know, I kind of like to get to the game tonight sometime. Um, so that's, that's where I am. I want to support this. I can support time, uh, a, de a, a postponement, and hopefully we can work some things out. And, and thank everyone for their public comments. I appreciate it. Thank you. Councilmember Roller. Uh, well, uh, I was going to make the motion to postpone, but I'd like to hear from others. But I have similar concerns. I, I, I generally like the, uh, the closure. I think that it functions well. I'm sure it's a benefit. I've, I've enjoyed it, actually, myself, dining out, outdoors. But I am concerned about potential harm to others. Um, the concerns of Trinity Church, I, I, I think, are valid and concerning. Um, I think that this would be helpful um, for us uh, to take some time to, uh, as Councilmember Volan said, to uh, receive some more data, uh, to receive some more public comment, to find if we can mitigate the effects, uh, the negative effects, um, provide a little more time for council reflection on this, something as, as important as this, as Councilmember Sims has said. Um, are, are there any other? Should we go to more, more comments? Then I'll, then I'll wait to postpone. Yeah. I think I had Councilmember Smith next. Oh, thank you. I, yeah, I, I generally support this whole idea. I, I, I would ask if, if it's all possible to see the breakdown on the um, who answered yes and who answered no for the merchants down there. Is that possible that I could get that data sent to me? to talk with them and ask and see if we could Can send you it share to your name you. for the record please? Uh, Talisha Kopic with Downtown Bloomington. Some were confidential. Oh, okay. Um, but I could ask I, them and okay, see if Okay, they feel I understand if, if they're all waving it off. I understand. Okay. I think it'd be interesting 
for me and perhaps other council members too to see okay. the breakdown of that. Yeah. Okay. I'll okay. ask them. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Cobb. Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Um, yes, I, uh, I'm in favor of taking more time. I um, like the idea that Councilmember Volan brought up about possibly uh, splitting the, uh, the block from Indiana to Dunn uh, down the middle uh, to accommodate both the bicycle garage and uh, Lenny's. Um, I think it's something worth looking into. I'm also concerned about Trinity Church and having a conversation with them to see, um, I mean, they mentioned that there was an accessible way to get into the church from Grant, but it was uh, kind of a hassle, so I'd like to know more about that. Um, I note that uh, across the street from them is the Village Deli, so uh, blocking off the street just to the east is uh, you know, problematic for that other business, so, or other business, Trinity is not a business, obviously. So I just think um, I'd like to have more time to have some conversations, and uh, as Councilmember Sims said, let's try to work out some of these problems before we continue the program. Overall, I, I also think it's a great program. I, um, uh, I would like to um, move towards the shared street. I think that was a great um, part of our transportation plan, and I uh, will be getting with planning transportation to see where that might be as far as the timeline. Um, the, it, that really is, I mean, it's, it's a big capital investment because you have to kind of uh, flatten the curbs and, and, and very carefully design the street, but um, in many places in Europe where there are pedestrian districts, they still let cars in, um, you know, for deliveries and such, but it's just a highly controlled and very slow environment for the cars, and so it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's a very people-oriented street, and the cars are kind of the intruders, but they're like the necessary uh, intruders. We know that, you know, if we're gonna enjoy the shops along here, we know that you guys have to do your your deliveries and stuff. So I think there, there's um, certainly in the future there's a way to, uh, to, well, in the terminology of Councilmember Sandberg, to, to make sure everybody is a winner, <laughs> uh, to accommodate all uses, and that's that's the ideal, and that's that's what I'd like to um, to work towards. Um, it it would take considerable education. Uh, engineering and, and capital investment, so I realize that it won't happen overnight. Um, in the meantime, I think uh, the, the closures in the past few years have been good, but I, I acknowledge some um, legitimate concerns uh, from entities uh, along the way this time that I'd like to take some more time to, to try to work out or try to, you know, get with staff to work out. Thank you. Council Member Sandberg. Thank you. Uh, just very briefly, I do support the postponement for the reasons that everyone has already uh, stated. Um, I too like the feel-good vibe of the summer, and I think people who like Kirkwood for that, that's all well and good, but there are some very pragmatic matters to deal with that I would much rather get dealt with now rather than just leave this up to staff. I think, and we've heard enough feedback about the people who have genuine concerns that we need to spend more time with that. I, I too like the idea of the, uh, the shared street along Kirkwood, but there's, there are other engineering issues having to do with the really serious flooding that we had um, that we cannot dismiss as not a problem for people, that we need to make sure our infrastructure and our, our stormwater systems are uh, able to accommodate any uh, additional flood that uh, could cause the devastation that we all saw uh, in that area. So uh, one more week will give us the time to make the sausage more gradually and more uh, systematically and not just leave it up to you know, some future data collection. I think we've heard enough of the problems now. We know what to do. Thank you. Council Member Rosenbarger. Thank you. Um, I just wanted, uh, just for clarification, I think it's, is it two more weeks until we have our next regular session? I think that's right, March 1st. Yes, it will be March 1st. Great, thank you. So it'll be two weeks. Um, just wanted to touch base a little bit on some things folks said, if it's okay. 
saying first names for um, commenters today because it's easier. I, I don't want to lose the fact that um, Mr. Costello or Bob came tonight to say that business owners really appreciate predictability and planning in this process. So it is very hard. I mean, yes, the street might close April 3rd, but that's a lot. That's very soon if we're talking about restaurants and businesses getting in gear to maybe order new tables, umbrellas, you know, extra silverware and everything like that. So just want to make sure, um, I guess, urging council members to work with staff over the next two weeks to make sure your questions get answered so that we can have a decision on the, on the next meeting on March 1st for everyone. Um, I, I'm okay postponing this. I would say um, I heard Mr. Allen say that uh, these types of iterations that are needed and changes for the church, for example, are something that are built into this process. And so I would be happy with what has, um, I think, been discussed tonight that, you know, ESD is very much on board with like working through these problems and coming up with creative solutions. Um, I think Mr. Cassidy talked about drop-off zones, which sounds like that could be a very good idea for some of the side streets with access. Um, so I would be okay to just say yes, and I understand those are really going to get worked out. I would also like to say I really appreciate everyone who commented tonight that um, even though we don't engage with each other, it feels like a really robust discussion that we had, and everyone here was like, I like what's happening. It's just there are some little kinks that we need to deal with, and um, I just I really appreciate that. So thank you, everyone, for coming. One thing about talking about what does success look like um, and how we measure this, I come from a world of like evaluation and surveying for seven years. And uh, what I like to say is that outputs are very different from outcomes. And a lot of times out, outputs are very easy to measure, right? So that is like number of dollars that we spend, that we receive or do not receive on parking, right? Um, it is uh, money that a business brings in over, over that month. It is potentially like the number of new employees um, that, that, that that business might have. But outcomes are very different and they're very qualitative and they're much more challenging to, um, to measure, and, right? So, and that looks at like, right, how does somebody feel when they come here? Do they feel safe, right? Uh, and the idea of uh, closing one lane of Kirkwood and leaving one lane open, I think would just like dramatically decrease the safety of someone who says, I love the idea that I can go back and forth between the upstairs and Nick's, um, uh, you know, or the deli, and oof, I don't know what's on the other side there. The church, I think maybe that happens sometimes. So it is, I think it is really important, um, probably potentially for the end of this, to really look at how do we measure those qualitative data points in different ways. I just wanted to like look at the survey and like not to critique uh, just this constructive criticism, but I think a question like, what did you dislike about the Kirkwood Street closure? Um, almost like warrant, like encourages someone to pick something that they disliked, whether or not they disliked something. And like one is actually just a fact. I couldn't park near some businesses. Like that is actually just a fact of a street closure that you might not be able to park in front of that business anymore. So um, just like looking at those questions, you know, and um, thinking about ways to ask them to get people thinking critically about those answers and like capturing that qualitative outcome, I think would be very fun. Um, so in general, I support this closure. Thank you, ESD, for doing this again. I think your work on this um, has been lovely and happy to support it when that day comes. Thank you. Additional comments, Council Member Volan. Uh, first, I wanna welcome Ms. De La Rosa to the ESD staff. Didn't know uh, she had joined and that's great. Uh, welcome, you're stuck with us now. Uh, second, I didn't know that council member appearances were part of Kirkwood Business's uh, marketing plans. So Mr. Costello, whenever you want to talk, I'm available for a name image likeness contract. I mean, just whenever, whenever you want. Um, it looks like we are gonna buy a couple of weeks to gather info. That's what good council deliberation is all about. But I would like to frame the discussion to come with some important observations and facts. We could keep closing all of East Kirkwood. It would be vibrant, no question. We already know at least that merchants taking part in the Parklet program are paying a substantial amount to participate. We know that it doesn't quite replace the revenue from parking demand before the pandemic, but we're not collecting meter revenue for its own sake. It's not our mission for having meters. But that is one set of data council should receive before the next meeting 
a comparison of the amount collected from parklets to the amount that used to be collected in meters in the years prior to the pandemic. Uh, we won't have the 2019 data by then, but we do have 2017 and 18 data for at least a fair comparison. But the key to a complete street, as well as to parking of vehicles on the street, is shareability. That's the magic word that the Parking Commission has been seeking since it was created. A parking space and the street and public spaces in general are better when they're shared. This is why we don't reserve on-street spaces in the public right-of-way for private parking anymore. It's better when it's shared. The, so also the vibrancy of a city comes from the mixture of uses and our ability to accommodate all uses. Pedestrian malls are generally very popular, but they come at a huge price. Just ask the merchants of Iowa City and Charlottesville. I want to leave a lane open wherever possible, but that lane should be so narrow that it functions like an alley, five miles an hour. That still provides connectivity without uh, uh, creating dangerous conditions. Can we have that aerial, can we have that uh, Google Maps picture up? So I've asked Mr. Lucas to put up um, uh, the 500 block of East Kirkwood. Okay, you can see those two tents in the middle there are Lenny's, and you can see that they clearly only occupy one full lane of East Kirkwood in the 500 block. Uh, on all three blocks of Kirkwood that are closed, uh, only one lane of each is in use by restaurants. There's plenty of room not only to let a car through, but a bike lane if you use Jersey barriers. You can certainly provide a bike lane just to get past Lenny's and then let the rest of the street be open on the, uh, the eastbound side, the south side. Can you move to the 400 block, East Kirkwood, please? That's it. You'll see that uh, Cafe Pizzeria, the, or sorry, that's the deli and Nick's. Uh, I'm not sure who's got the benches out on the south side of the street, but they're basically in the parking uh, spaces and they should be treated like parklets. We can do the same thing here. We can open up the entire eastbound lane of the 400 block of East Kirkwood to both a car and a bike traffic. And in fact, providing a bike lane would uh, force the cars to go slowly and therefore be, uh, be able to safely traverse this area. Um, finally, let's go to the 100 block, three blocks west. Here you can see the umbrellas clustered there on the side that belong to the Uptown and Farm, and just to their east are Jersey barriers. That's what's separating the alley and the rest of that block from the closed off block. All right. Then notice that they're also, although they have, I, I you know, attended both of these restaurants and they do sort of uh, move into the northbound lane, we can even make that work here if we really want to. I'm not necessarily suggesting it, if everyone's okay with it, uh, because I think we've got a solution here. But the key thing is it's possible in all three cases and that in any good piazza in Italy or platea in Greece, cars do go right through the middle of the town square. They just do it at five miles an hour. There's no reason why we can't do it here, especially if we, if we uh, force them to do it. Uh, so the stanchions being, you can take it down, thanks. You could, the stanchions being installed when they were in 2019, 2020 were incredibly well-timed. Using them to close off the whole street was convenient and perhaps inexpensive and the right thing to do for the past three years. But we've now heard that there are costs to others from other businesses and organizations and users. It's not gonna be the end of the world if we do this one more year, but it is time to have a better plan. Mr. Crowley defends the program itself against people who didn't want to change the way things always were, but uh, we're also, he's also recommending that the plan be exactly as it was for the past three years. I don't think that we have to necessarily um, uh, do it exactly the same way for the whole calendar year 2023. It's worth the investment in Jersey barriers. It's worth the investment in more stanchions, especially considering it would be a nominal expense from the food and beverage tax. While the restaurants are still positioned precariously, their revenues last year were the highest they've been since the program began collecting taxes in 2018. Uh, they went from, I think it was 3.6 million in 2021 to 4.2 million. Okay, the restaurants are actually doing okay even though they're still precarious. That's why we should continue the program, but we also can afford 
especially while we're trying to figure out what we're going to do with the convention center, to buy a few of the barriers, the stanchions, they shouldn't cost more than high five figures, low six figures. They're worth the investment. Most importantly, though, is meter data. I really regret that the Parking Commission hasn't been able to compile meter data for the past few years because it's behind on reporting. I've advised Mr. Crowley that the data for the pandemic years is all on order uh, so that we can evaluate. But we learned last week that it's taking several weeks because the vendors have to remove identifying characteristics of usage data, and we're talking about on the order of 1.8 million meter transactions per year. Um, but, and I requested the data a few weeks back, not really anticipating that this question would be debated when it was. But when we get the data, we, the Parking Commission and ESD collectively, we're not just gonna look at the blocks that were closed, we're gonna look at adjacent blocks that were not closed and try to determine what trends we can from the closures in the area in general. I don't think, I don't agree actually that we can't reevaluate midway through this season. We could do like previ previous years in the second quarter, April, May, June, and in the third quarter, July, August, September, the second half of the program year, we could perhaps have a plan to try closing lanes rather than whole blocks. It's clear there's enough concern that we should at least be contemplating it if for no other reason than for a plan for next year. I also don't agree with Ms. Hutchins' concern over fire truck access to the church, and I contrast it to Mr. Wright's appreciation of not having to look both ways to walk across the street, but his pleasure doesn't take into account every other of Ms. Hutchins' points, which were very well taken, about access for the disabled and the infirm and to parishioners in general. In the 100 block of East Kirkwood, we've heard tonight concerns about pandemic access to CVS, access to the parking lot east of the alley, which is to be developed, and delivery concerns for the bookstore. We, this needs to be a shared street. We all need to share these streets. So I believe that my idea has merit, uh, and even if it doesn't uh, become a part of the program uh, in two weeks, which I'm not expecting, uh, we can at least be evaluating it for the middle of this year. I agree with Councilmember Sandberg's concerns to a great extent, but on one fundamental point I think we disagree, I do wholeheartedly support the program. I think we've seen more than enough evidence that this idea is both good and popular. I wholeheartedly support continuing this program into the foreseeable future, and I believe we should make it permanent. But we should invest in the infrastructure necessary to make it more attractive, and more importantly, to maintain transportation connectivity and the shareability of these most important streets of our city. One last thing I want to point out, we do have some data that I want to mention. The, uh, one, the 400 block of East Kirkwood has 23 meters on it, give or take, and it generated $70,600 in revenue in 2017, which is the data I happen to have in front of me, an average of more than $10 a day, and the second highest gen revenue generating block in the city. The 500 East Kirkwood block was the seventh highest generating revenue in the city that year. There are only 14 meters and it generated $41,621. The 100 block of East Kirkwood has roughly 16 meters. It generated $45,465. It was the four, eight, the 12th most used block in the city. Together, we're talking about 130 some thousand dollars in revenue. If you consider that only half the block of the 100 block of Kirkwood was closed off, you're still talking about $112,000 or so. That's a measurable amount that we can use to compare how much we, gener we, we generated in revenue from parklets and the like. We can also go to individual spots and we'll have that data uh, uh, in a few weeks, we'll know how, how much each parklet uh, generated in revenue in the three years prior to the pandemic, and we'll know in the three years after the pandemic. It will be very good comparative data that we'll be able to have sometime in March or April. But uh, the data is out there. The 2018 report has been approved and will be up uh, tomorrow or Friday, and it will have similar data for people to take a look at to get a sense of just how popular these blocks are they are absolutely the uh, most de in demand blocks in the city that shouldn't be any surprise to anybody. But we have data, we have receipts, we should be using them, we should be comparing them, and there's no reason we can't do that between now and March 1st. Thank you all very much for letting me make it set. Thank you. I think that's everyone. If not, I'll finish up very quickly. Uh, I'm generally supportive 
of close, the closure of Kirkwood. I'm less enthusiastic about parklets um, because we haven't yet found a way to make them look like something other than a construction zone. Uh, and I think we need to work on that. And, and I think we have seen examples in other cities that may inform what we choose to do here. Um, but I do generally favor that. That said, um, I would feel more confident making a decision on this if I knew what data we were seeking and what our decision process is going to be following this summer. I understand that this season would provide uh, additional data and additional insights, and it would be our first normal year post-pandemic and so forth, and I, I get all that. Um, but I'd feel better if we had, uh, if I knew there was a more robust discussion going on about specific measures that we are using and specific research questions we are bringing to the table, whether that's the impact on sales for the impact on sales for retail versus the impact on sales for restaurants, um, the differences in meter revenue and so forth. I think there are a lot of very specific questions I would like to see laid out now, not at the end of, of a season. So I would offer that thought. Um, but other than that, I do favor uh, another couple weeks to think about this and to gather data. Uh, and toward that end, I would welcome a motion if there is one. Yes, I'll make a motion to postpone council action on resolution 2304 until our meeting March 1st. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, or is there any discussion? Should we have a roll call? Need a roll call vote. Yep. Is there any discussion? Or we've already had it. All right, in that case, will the clerk, Madam Kirk, Clerk, will you please call the roll? Yes, Council Member Rosenbarger? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Rollo? Yes. Sims? Yes. Smith? Yes. And Volan? Yes. That motion to postpone passes 8 0. Thank you, everyone. We will take up Resolution 2304 again on, at our next regular session on March 1st. Madam President, I move that Ordinance 2303 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. Madam Clerk, will you please read? Ordinance 2303 to amend Title 15 of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Vehicles and Traffic regarding amending Section 1512.010 to remove seven stop intersections, to add six stop intersections, and to delete one four-way stop intersection, Section 1512.020 to add one yield intersection, Section 1532.030 to delete angle parking on 4th Street between College Avenue and Gentry Street, Section 1532.080 to add no parking spaces on Duncan Drive, 19th Street, and Strong Drive, and to remove no parking spaces on Grant Street and 19th Street, and Section 1532.090 to add limited parking zones to 8th Street. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance amends Title 15, Vehicles and Traffic of the Bloomington Municipal Code, and comes forth at the request of city staff the Parking Commission, the Traffic Commission, and the Bicycle and Pedestrian Safety Commission. The ordinance makes the following changes. Removes seven stop intersections and adds six stop intersections. Removes one multi-stop intersection at Jefferson Street and 7th Street. Adds one yield intersection. Removes angle parking on 4th Street between College Avenue and Gentry Street. Adds no parking spaces on Duncan Drive. 19th Street and Strong Drive, removes no parking spaces on Grant Street and 19th Street, and adds limited parking zones on 8th Street. Thank you very much. We will take up Ordinance 2303 next at our regular session on March 1st. So, and that brings us to our second period of public comment. Um, this is again for items that are not on the agenda this evening. Mr. Lucas, could you extend our invitation on Zoom, please? Yes, if there are any members of the public that wish to comment, please let us know by using the raise hand feature, which you can find in your control bar by clicking the reactions button or the more button. You can also send a chat to the meeting host to let us know you'd like to speak. And here in chambers, why don't we go ahead and start, if you would. Please share your name for the record. Please sign in, and then you'll have five minutes. 
I wanted to talk tonight about veterans a little bit. Uh, we hear about how down, downtrodden and how, how hurt we've been by the wars and the different things and how many suicides there are, how much drug addiction there is. And I'd like to point out that all of us who were drafted were drafted from the lower class. None of the college kids had to go to, to uh, Vietnam. So um, the social problems that existed for draftees, much of, many of them existed before they were drafted. Many of us were put in there by the judge. But all that aside, it was the thing that made me an American. I don't think I could understand my fellow citizens if I hadn't been dumped by draft into all the other races that inhabit our country. Mexicans, Samoans, Hawaiians, Indians, blacks, and you're all poor, and you're all dumped into the same thing, and you're given a job to do to keep alive and keep each other alive, and you get good at it. And because of that, we trusted each other. We had a trust. That trust is gone in this country. I still have it amongst my fellow veterans and a few people I know, but most of that trust is gone, and it's led to the kind of anti-democratic problems that we have today, not just, in the, not just in the federal government, but from top to bottom. This disunion has been sown as a seed for a long, long time, since the early 80s. 82, they got rid of all the third parties and the independents by legislation. So the only two parties left were the corporate parties, Democrats and Republicans. Even got rid of the write-in vote. Sent five of us to jail for trying to write in a vote. That was, re you got your write-in vote back through Sarah Evans Barker. But none of y'all have ever been concerned about the loss of the write-in vote or the loss of all the independents. And that concerns me a lot. The fact that you're willing to settle for a two-party system without rank, without rank choice voting and without having any independents in there, it makes me think that you're part of a system that has systematic problems that cannot be solved with y'all. And that's, that's my, my problem right now. And the problem that I've encountered is the problem of lying. The fact that people are willing, able, to lie to each other about important things at this period in time is a real problem for our democracy. And everybody, I think we, we understand that to some extent, but what we don't understand is how far it's gotten into our community. The things, and I don't want to bring them all in public right now because some of them would hurt people's feelings, but I would appreciate if anyone would come to me and say, uh, what happened when you filed a complaint in court and asked to open up another early voting poll station when the, the line was four blocks long for a month? What happened to you when you went into court and had that experience? Um, there's so many things like what happened to New Leaf, New Life? Why have there been five deaths in custody in the jail and no investigation? Nobody says anything. We know it's a pit down there. It's a pit, not for, for humans. And the women's drunk tank is the worst part of it. But I don't hear any complaints. I don't hear any call for an investigation of four deaths, five deaths in custody. Not a word, not from the county council, not from the city council. 80% of the people in that jail are Bloomington citizens. But I don't hear anything. I think I'm talking to satisfied people that are of a higher class than me, that are colonizing this area to the west that I live in, that I that I raised my kid in where I couldn't possibly afford a house now. Um, but thanks for the lights at the Switchyard Park. Thank you, Mr. Haggerty. Mr. Mr. Lucas, do we have any takers on Zoom? Not that I see, no. Okay, and are there any other comments here in chambers? Okay, seeing none, that closes our second period of public comment. We'll now take up matters of, of council schedule. Mr. Lucas. 
Uh, thank you. Just a reminder, uh, it was mentioned earlier, the Council has no regular session next Wednesday. Uh, so we will meet next in regular session on March the 1st. Uh, there are several committee <laughs> meetings coming up uh, over the next week and uh, week or so. Uh, on February 20th, there's a special committee on council processes. Uh, February 21st, Climate Action and Resilience Committee will host a meeting here in, uh, in the McCloskey Room at 6 p.m. Uh, the committee on council processes uh, may meet again if needed on February 23rd at 8 a.m. Uh, the state of the city address is uh, that same day, February 23rd at 6 p.m. Uh, beginning at 6 p.m. And on February 28th, the Council's Jack Hopkins uh, Committee will kick off its process this year uh, at 6 p.m. Those dates and times are all on the city website and calendar. Uh, so lots of meetings coming up, um, uh, but no regular session next week. That's all okay. I've got. Thank you so much. Anything else for the good of the order? If not, we are adjourned. Good night, everyone. Thank you.